Now, today we will be discussing about anti-anginal drugs. But before I really start the drugs, I will briefly review about the pathophysiology of important type of anginas, right? First of all, uh, we'll define that what is angina. Angina is one of the very common symptom of cardiac ischemia. What is angina? Angina is a, angina is a symptom of cardiac ischemia. How we really define angina, right? Angina is, it, it may be pain, it may not be pain, look. It is, angina is a central chest discomfort or pain, which may be just like pressing pain or weight-like discomfort or band-like discomfort or like a heavy weight on the chest. And this uncomfortable feeling in the chest may be radiating to one arm or to the both arm or to the neck or to the jaw or to the epigastrium or may not radiate at all or may be felt only in the area of radiation. Again, let me explain. What is angina? Right? Angina is, angina is a clinical syndrome resulting from transient reversible cardiac ischemia. It is resulting from transient reversible cardiac myocardial ischemia. Clinically, it presents as central chest pain or chest discomfort. Right? And this feeling is less like a pain, more like a weight or like pressure on the chest or like a constricting band on the chest or sometimes as a burning sensation, right? And this chest discomfort or so-called pain may radiate to one arm or to the both arm or to the neck or to the jaw or to the epigastrium or may not radiate at all or sometimes may be felt only in the area of radiation. And why it is there? It is due to transient ischemia of the myocardium. Is that right? Due to imbalance in oxygen supply and demand. When oxygen supply is less to the myocardium and demand is more and uh, oxygen supply and needs of the myocardium are not met with, that may produce the symptom, symptom complex. But a very, very important point is, which I have not mentioned yet about angina is, the duration about angina. Typically, angina should not last more than 20 minutes. This cutoff point is very, very important. Usually, angina lasts somewhere between 15 seconds to 15 minutes. Usually, most of the angina lasts somewhere between 15 seconds to 15 minutes. The point which I want to really plant in your mind is, that angina should not last or does not last classically by more than 20 minutes. Why? Because if severe chest ischemia lasts more than 20 minutes, that will lead to myocardial infarction. If severe chest ischemia or myocardial ischemia, if severe myocardial ischemia lasts more than 20 minutes, then it will lead to myocardial infarction. And once there is infarction, of course it is not angina because by definition angina is transient, reversible ischemia of the myocardium which does not lead to death of myocardial cells, which does not lead to necrosis of myocardial cells. Now, typically there are three types of anginas, right? There is classical angina, Classical angina. Classical angina is also called typical angina. And classical angina or typical angina or another name for the same situation is, yes please, stable angina. Stable angina. And still another name is exertional angina. Exertional angina, right? This type of angina, which is classical angina, or which is typical angina, or which is called stable angina or exertional angina, it has a special type of pathophysiology under it, right? Now let me tell you what's wrong with this patient. Let's suppose this is a left ventricle. 
now here is the coronary artery suppose this is the coronary artery and this has a atherosclerotic plaque this coronary artery has atherosclerotic plaque and this plaque atherosclerotic plaque is obstructing the lumen more than 70 percent if atherosclerotic plaque obstructs the lumen more than 70 percent then it is quite possible that blood flow through the narrow area may be enough during the resting stage. When patient is resting, the little blood which is coming through the narrow area may be enough for the resting myocardium. But as soon as there is increased work of the myocardium, for example, when patient is doing some exertion or due to some emotional stress or any reason, if heart rate goes up, right? Then if there is increased work of the myocardium, then this stenotic point cannot dilate and this point does not allow extra blood for the myocardium which is demanding more oxygen due to increased work and then relative ischemia will drop. Again let me tell you exactly what happens. Let me make a diagram. If I remove this piece of myocardium outside, this is a piece of myocardium, right? This is the vessel coronary vessel now in this coronary vessel let me repeat in case of which angina classical angina there is atherosclerotic plaque and this atherosclerotic plaque will produce symptoms of angina when it is obstructing more than 70% of the lumen. If 70% of the lumen is blocked by this plaque, right, that will, that may produce enough blood for the resting myocardium, but when myocardium works extra during tachycardia or emotional upsets or when patient is doing exercise or there is any type of increased cardiac work, whenever there is increased cardiac work, usually the healthy vessel dilate and provide extra blood. But this stenotic point cannot dilate. So whenever there is more work stress on the heart, this narrow point cannot provide extra blood. And this part of the myocardium, this is called vulnerable myocardium, this part of the myocardium, this will become relatively ischemic. Is that right? And this part of the myocardium, when it becomes ischemic, this is the source of anginal pain or anginal discomfort. Is that right? Now, because this obstruction is stable, it does not change overnight. This obstruction is stable. So usually the patient's symptoms are also stable. For example, that patient has usually predictable exercise that he can walk so much and then he will get the anginal pain or anginal discomfort. Is that right? And this type of angina is always precipitated by exertion or emotional upsets, right? And usually relieved by taking rest. The classical angina is usually relieved by taking rest. Because just when you, when patient who was walking and exerting and myocardium started working more and demanding more oxygen and because this point did not dilate, so it could not provide extra oxygen to the extra working myocardium, ischemia sets in. If ischemic pain start, anginal pain start, if patient start taking rest, right, usually within 3-4 minutes or few minutes, cardiac work in this area will become so low. Cardiac work in this area after taking rest, cardiac area, uh, work in this area will become so low that it will be able, right, its demand will be able to meet with the reduced supply. So, angina will disappear. Is that right? Or other way to reduce this type of angina is by giving the nitrates. By giving the nitrates. I will explain later how the nitrates work. But this angina is very predictably responsive to the nitrates. As soon as you take sublingual nitrates, right, within few minutes, your stable angina's pain should disappear. Is that clear? But one point which is very important, that if this obstruction become more than 90%, then even anginal pain may occur at rest. 
because if it is obstruct, uh, producing obstruction more than 90% of the lumen, only 10% of the lumen is perfusing, then this, so, this, this very low perfusion is even not to, able to meet the demands of the resting myocardium. Now, this was your classical angina, right? One more point which is very important about the classical angina is that the myocardium which is more near to the endocardium. This is the deepest myocardium. Is that right? And this is the myocardium which is in superficial area. This is subpericardial myocardium and this is subendocardial myocardium and this is the middle myocardium. Now the point which I want to highlight that out of this innermost zone, middle zone of myocardium and outer zone of myocardium. First of all, ischemia occur to the innermost zone. Why? Because when chest wall is, when they, oh, sorry, this myocardial muscle is contracting against the blood present in the cavity, right? This is the innermost layer of the myocardium, this layer of the myocardium, innermost layer of the myocardium, which is compressed by the external myocardium and the blood in the cavity. Is that right? And when this myocardium, which is called subendocardial myocardium, is compressed, then the microcirculation through this, the small vessels through this myocardium is also compressed. Is that right? So whenever heart is contracting strongly, it is the inner myocardium which is most deprived of perfusion. Right? And during even a normal heart, the outer myocardium is better perfused and inner myocardium is poorly perfused. Is that right? Am I clear to everyone? This is few words about classical angina. Then there is another type of angina and this angina is entirely different than the classical. Yeah, this is Prince Metal angina. I am going to discuss some of my students are in love with Prince Metal, right? And remember it. Now look, in this case, real problem is not the atherosclerotic lien. In these patients, atherosclerotic lesions are not responsible for the symptomatology of angina. There may be either very small atherosclerotic lesions or there are not atherosclerotic lesions. Real problem is that coronary artery has fluctuating tone. Right? Now look at it. This is the point. What has happened? There is vasospasticity. What is there? There is vaso coronary artery spasm. Right? And this spasm lead to myocardial ischemia, but here the point is very important. Ischemia will go to the innermost area as well as middle area, even outer area. Is that right? Because in case of classical angina, there was less blood coming and this less blood was preferentially perfusing the outer myocardium and inner myocardium was deprived. But when we go to this type of angina, which is due to coronary tone fluctuation, it is also called Prince metal angina, which is mainly due to coronary artery spasticity, either with a little bit atherosclerotic lien or with no atherosclerotic lien. Is that right? In this case, ischemia will occur throughout the wall of the myocardium and this is called transmural ischemia. This is called transmural ischemia. Is that right? The, this type of angina is not related with the exertion. This type of angina is not related with the blood pressure. This type of angina is not related with tachycardia. This type of angina may precipitate even with when patient is at rest. This type of angina is more common in females. I don't know the spastic disease why vasospasticity is more common in females. Uh, but fluctuation coronary artery tone is more common in human females. So. What really happens that this angina has been called, it has two names, one is Prince Metal Angina, Prince Metal Angina and other is Variant Angina, Variant Angina. Now this Prince Metal Angina or Variant Angina, this is basically Coronary Vasospastic Angina, this is Coronary Vasospastic Angina. Why I am explaining these two? So clearly, because the treatment of both are slightly different from each other. Is that right? If I draw a big piece of myocardium here, here what you will find that coronary artery 
right? It has undergone spasticity. So naturally, angina is ischemic pain, ischemia is present throughout the wall of the myocardium and this ischemia is called transmural ischemia, right? This was what type of ischemia? Yeah, this ischemia was subendocardial sub endocardial myocardial ischemia it's the in only in the deeper part right this is full thickness right now this type of angina is not related with the exertion and it is not relieved by taking rest is that right then we come to third type of angina the third type of angina is called unstable angina unstable angina First, let me explain the pathophysiology of unstable angina. Then I will tell you exactly why it is called unstable angina. In patient with unstable angina, what is really there? There is unstable coronary plaque. The atheromatous plaque in coronary artery is unstable. Right? Let me explain it more clearly. Well, this is the piece of myocardium. Here is coronary artery. Here is atheromatous plaque. But the real problem is that this atheromatous plaque is unstable. Unstable means maybe it has, we call such plaques vulnerable plaque. Vulnerable plaque means which are not stable plaques. These are having very thin fibrous cap and lot of inflammatory activity going on within the plaque and such plaque may undergo severe acute changes. For example, this plaque may undergo fissuring or ulceration or erosion or it may undergo intraplaque hemorrhage. Any type of acute change may occur in the plaque and when there is acute change in this plaque then its surface become very irregular and thrombogenic, right? When this, is, this plaque surface is ulcerated or erosion or it is fissured or it is ruptured or there is interrupt plaque hemorrhages, all these things expose highly thrombogenic content from the atheroma and platelets will stick on that. Platelets will stick on that. Let me make it even more clear. If I enlarge this area like this, this is the coronary artery. This was the stable plaque. This was the stable plaque. Here is let's suppose another plaque which is unstable and this plaque has very much disturbed surface, right? And over this, this is the intraplaque cholesterol and other things. Then, then superficial layer is disturbed. Maybe there's ulceration or erosion or fissuring or rupture and then platelets stick on it. These are the platelets which are sticking on it. There's platelet adhesion as well as there is platelet aggregation. Platelet adhesion plus platelet aggregation, right? And there may be even super, uh, super added fibrinogen. Fibrinogen which is converted into fibrin. Is that right? Because of coagulation process, the coagulation, super added coagulation process converts soluble fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin over the surface of the platelet. And when platelet plug is load, is de having the deposition of fibrin, then whole this thing is called thrombus. All this thing is called thrombus. Now look, when this uh, thrombus has formed over an unstable plaque, is that right? There will be severe ischemia. There will be severe ischemia uh, and this severe ischemia, right, will be initially in deeper part of the myocardium, subendocardial myocardium. Initially the very severe ischemia is in deeper part of myocardium. But if this thrombus, remember, if this thrombus occlude the complete lumen of the vessel, then ischemia may become transmural. Is that right? Now, what you have to remember is that this unstable plaque has led to the formation of platelet plug and coagulation process over it, resulting into thrombotic situation. So, plaque with super added thrombus is a dynamic obstruction. This is a dynamic obstruction because platelet and thrombus keep on changing their size. 
right and keep on changing their mass size so the degree of occlusion is also dynamic so we can say this plaque is not stable because this plaque is not stable at any moment it may develop a thrombus and then thrombus may enlarge and produce severe ischemia this severe ischemia if it lasts more than 20 minutes now listen with open ears if this severe ischemia lasts more than 20 minutes this will under this my dependent myocardium will undergo infarction and if you treat the patient well within 20 minutes right and you do thrombolysis or there is spontaneous thrombolysis or pharmacologically induced thrombolysis within 20 minutes it means infarction will not be there right due to this reason this type of angina is said unstable angina because it is so unstable that if it is not managed well if within if it's a obstruction of the lumen lasts more than 20 minutes or 30 minutes it may fall to the category of myocardial infarction is that clear right and this type of angina by definition it is very severe angina okay write down the definition of unstable angina unstable angina is severe angina of recent onset or angina with progressively increasing frequency or angina with progressively increasing frequency or angina which is precipitated angina which is precipitated by progressively reducing exertion or even at rest let me repeat it again what is unstable angina unstable angina is a dangerous angina because if it's not managed well it, it has a high chance to convert into myocardial infarction right it does not remain stable as an angina and what is the underlying pathology of unstable angina it has unstable atheromatous plaque with superadded what thrombus formation and even this platelet may release some vasospastic element and sometimes there is even added vasospastic element as well so how many things are there yeah it may release thromboxin a2 yes that may produce vasospasticity excellent so it has atheromatous plaque which is undergoing acute changes it may develop platelet plug on the platelet plug it may develop deposition of fibrin then there may be local production of vasoconstrictor by the disturbed plaque and the superadded thrombus and may lead to vasospasticity is that right and this type of angina if it lasts longer it's very severe pain and very classical you know diagnostic point is write it down this angina does not respond well to nitrates and taking rest because you have to differentiate the patient of stable angina with the unstable angina the classical difference is that a stable angina patient or classical angina patient as soon as this patient take rest or take nitrates within few minutes pain will disappear but when we will go to the unstable angina right unstable angina cannot be relieved by taking rest and cannot be relieved by taking nitrates is that right that is the diagnostic point so whenever you have a patient with very severe angina and patient is not angina is not disappearing with the taking rest or not disappearing with the sublingual nitrates right the real uh, you know diagnostic point is they say when patient has taken sublingual nitrate tablets three times three times within 15 minutes when a patient of angina has taken sublingual nitrates three times within 15 minutes and pain is not relieved and it is unstable angina until proved otherwise it is unstable angina until proved otherwise is it clear now look at the pathophysiology of all these three situations these situations are different because these situations are different their management is going to be different let me tell you very basic clue when you are thinking your strategies pharmacological strategies to manage these patient look attention here classical angina right it is basically precipitated by increased work of the myocardium it is precipitated by increased work of the myocardium so the best therapy should be to reduce the work of the myocardium we have to use those drugs in this case which classically reduce the work of the myocardium right most effective strategy is that angina is due to increased work so we 
so treatment should have those pharmacological modalities which will reduce the work of myocardium work of myocardium if we reduce the work of myocardium that will of course lead to reduced oxygen demand and if you have reduced the oxygen demand right the management during the acute phases they should, should reduce the work of the heart so that there should be reduced oxygen demand and when there is so you have to reduce the oxygen demand so much that reduced oxygen demand become equal to the reduced oxygen supply you have to re-establish the balance between oxygen supply and demand here the art of management is reduce the work of the myocardium so much that reduced oxygen demand becomes equal to the reduced oxygen supply and then symptoms of angina will disappear am i clear but when you come to this patient this is due to vasospasticity do you think reducing the work of heart will help this patient no this is a spasm right so art of management the best strategy in this patient is you do coronary vaso dilation you have to use the drugs which classically dilate the coronary artery now listen carefully coronary vasodilator do not work very effectively in this case coronary vasodilator work wonderfully for the prince metal angina the best drug presently is calcium channel blocker nifedipine nifedipine but of course nitrates can also dilate the coronary artery if it is spastic but you have to remember here in this case in this case if you use a drug which will only dilate the coronary artery will not be much helpful help will be very little the reason being here atherosclerosis plaque is a fixed obstruction and atherosclerosis sclerosis or sclerosis of artery due to atheroma is not amenable to significant dilatation if you give coronary dilator maybe if there is some super added little bit spasticity that may be relieved but because obstruction here is not dynamic obstruction is fixed so usually by increasing the perfusion of strategies don't work well except either you do big game here for example coronary what is this p t c a that is percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty that that may help in this case or you do cabbage that is coronary artery bypass grafting so that you provide the flow around the obstruction right so we can say that because in stable angina atheromatous plaque is stable but it is a fixed obstruction so by drugs it cannot be easily dilated during the acute phase is that right but point one thing in the long run these patients should be advised these patients should be advised to reduce the risk factor for atherosclerosis during the acute phase when angina is there right that moment you have to give a drug which will reduce the work of the heart so that reduced work and reduced oxygen demands meet the reduced oxygen supply but in the long, long run in these patients and other all of the patient with angina you have to advise for avoiding the risk factor for atherosclerosis or managing them for example smoking should be stopped diabetes should be managed well hyperlipidemia should be managed well hypertension should be managed well lifestyle should be improved for example stressful lifestyle should be reduced sedentary lifestyle should be reduced exercise should be done so all those advice to prevent the atherosclerosis they they are required in all these patient but during the acute phase when patient is really having angina what will help reducing the work of the heart what is the name of the medication i will go of course the whole lecture will come to this thing and i will tell you how the drugs combinations come and how they interact with each other and what combinations are good in which situations i'm going to make you a good doctor right but first yeah jamie what's your question so yeah yes but if you really want to manage them without drugs then you can do either you pass a catheter into coronary and with balloon angioplasty where you know you stretch out this point and you put a medicated stunt there 
right? This is one treatment which we will not discuss today because we are going to discuss the anti general drugs, right? Uh, second is you do coronary bypass graft, right? When you come to this situation, the best, do you think in this case we need uh, PTCA? No, now you know by logic you know that in this situation with those pastec, you don't need to do PTCA and of course here you don't need to do cabbage. There's no bypass, there's no fun in doing bypass grafting. Just give the drugs which keep the coronary artery dilated, that's it. Now we come to this drug. This type of situation. This, this type of patient really tests your medical, you can say, knowledge and competence, right? The test of your medical competence is by the patient with unstable angina. Only good doctors manage them in a good way. First, you have to understand pathophysiology before we start the management. There are four components in this whole game. You know, Leon is here. This is the area which is involving the Leon. Right? Now, what are the points here? Number one, there is a throma. Stable or unstable? unstable? Yeah, throma which is unstable, undergoing acute change. This is one problem. Number two, there is platelet aggregation. Platelet aggregation and plus fibrin deposition leading to thrombus formation. Plus there may be added component of vasospasm. Now, what should be the strategies to manage this patient? First of all, first of all, you should give the drugs which disperse the platelet from there. Thrombolytic drugs, antiplatelet agents. But do you think, look here, do you think in these two cases you need antiplatelet agents immediately? No. But remember, in the long run, we also give them aspirin as antiplatelet agent because you never know when this plaque may become unstable in future. But if you put this patient on aspirin, right, future risk of convert, conversion of this stable angina into unstable will be reduced. But the point which I want to put in your mind that in these cases, the treatment modalities are antiplatelet drugs, antithrombolytic drugs, antiplatelet or antithrombolytic drugs. You understand why? You want to dissolve the thrombus. As soon as this patient comes, you ask him to chew aspirin. The simple aspirin does wonder, right? Because it will not allow more platelet to stick on this obstructed point, right? Antiplatelet drugs should be given. Of course, there's more serious situation. In acute phase, you need to give oxygen. And more important than that, again, you have to reduce the work of, work of myocardium heart plus you have to give coronary artery dilator in a nutshell look to me in a nutshell in unstable angina you have to do everything what you do in stable angina and prismatal angina plus very important point you have to give some drugs which should be able to dissolve the thrombus and the, Thrombolytic drugs are of course not required in stable angina and they are not required in prismatal angina. Am I clear? Any question here? No question. Now, I will discuss into detail that what are the met methods to reduce the work of myocardium. Is that right? Because this is the work of the myocardium which determines the demand of the oxygen. And in these patients, ideally, we should increase the supply of oxygen and we should decrease the work of the heart. Now we will talk about what are the determinants of the work of the heart. Then we will see how drugs modify the determinants related with the work of the heart. Is there any question? No. There are many ways to explain the work of the heart, but I will explain in a very, very simple way. Right? In the terms of preload, after load, right? So and contractility. Now I want to know what is your concept of preload? 
What is preload? Have you heard of the term of preload when we talk about cardiovascular system? What is preload? You, you don't feel what is pre. Okay, Raul is going to tell us uh, what is afterload or preload. After afterload is like the work that is being uh, done after the, the pre-stretch of the myocardial tissues. I have more or less a comment. Okay, okay. Uh, I will tell you first. First, I will give you an analogy. You know your heart is a donkey. You don't know it. I will tell you. Our heart is like a donkey. Like it does donkey work all the time. Pumping the blood all the time. Taking from the venous side. Pumping into arterial side. Right? And we will see what are the problems of an ischemic donkey. Malnourished donkey. And how you can help a malnourished donkey. Is that right? Look. You have friends as donkeys, then you must be protected from a lot of nasty things. <laughs> it's good to have donkey friends, right? Now listen, listen. Attention please. Here is your heart. I don't know how to draw a good donkey, right? First I'll talk about the normal heart. Okay, let's make it a healthy. It's a happy, happy donkey. It's a healthy myocardium having lot of oxygen supply, good nutrition, right? Now, what is the function of this donkey? This donkey has to take some preload. Preload is the load on the donkey which it has to carry upward. First you imagine, there is a donkey which is having some load on it. And with this load, it has to go upward. Is that right? And it has to go against this resistance. This is the resistance against which this donkey has to perform right and here is low pressure donkey will work up build a pressure and take some preload here and deposit something here for example here it was 140 ml and it deposit here 70 ml and then this donkey will come back Right, 50% it, it has load, downloaded there. So this was the stroke work of donkey during one stroke and deposited 50 ml there and come back. Again take 70 ml more and again go back. Now how much work a donkey is doing? Listen, it's very easy to understand. Just a minute. We are talking about donkey, right? How much work per minute it is doing? It depends on number one. How much preload is there? If you put more preload, work of the donkey is more. If you are putting the more load on the donkey, work of the donkey is more. Number two, if you increase the resistance angle against which it has to work, work of the donkey will be more. Is that right? Thirdly, how many times per minute it moves? If it moves, for example, 130 times per minute, work is increased. Now, imagine ischemic myocardium. Ischemic myocardium is actually like a donkey which is undernourished. Like a donkey which is undernourished. Now it is undernourished donkey. Very weak. And no more smiley. This is ischemic myocardium. Now what is happening? Look. This donkey has to, it has less oxygen supply. Now, due to any reason, in classical engine I am talking about, if you take this like this, what has, what has happened? Resistance against which it is working is increased. If it is to work like this, can it work well? No, no and it will start crying. The cry is the anginal pain. The donkey is crying, the myocardium is crying because it is under anginal pain. Now, if this donkey cannot work well, how you can help him? What are the methods to help the ischemic myocardium? Ideal, th ideal thing should be you provide more nutrition to the donkey. This is one way. Give more perfusion. This is the ideal thing. Secondly, you can help it by reducing the preload. Right? You can reduce the load on the heart before it works. 
you can reduce the load on the myocardium or load on the donkey before it start working third strategy is you reduce the what is this resistance against which myocardium is contracting right now this is called preload the load on the myocardium before it work and resistance against which it was performing this is called after load myocardium perform against the arteriolar resistance you know arteriolar the narrow and myocardium has to pump against that impedance is that right that is after load that is the resistance so if you really want to help this donkey number one increase the perfusion number two reduce the preload number three reduce the resistance. after load the resistance and next point is in strategy be merciful to this donkey and and reduce its number of visits not 140 per minute it should be maybe 65 per minute if this donkey with less preload working against less resistance and total number of stroke per minute are less maybe its work is so much less that even in ischemic donkey can pro perform well do you understand it so now i will put the analogy on the true thing real thing but you should not forget your heart is a donkey it needs constant perfusion right and when it is reduced perfusion one way to help this donkey is reduce the work of the donkey reduce the work of the heart how you can reduce the work of the heart reduce the preload or reduce the afterload and reduce the total heart rate all these things will help the donkey to manage this crisis right what was your question how do I reduce resistance on the preload uh, I'm going to explain now Mr. Abdul has asked that what are the real thing how you reduce the preload and how you reduce the afterload this is your question we are going to do that thing pharmacologically very soon right yes Jamie Oh yes, he is thinking how we can give nutrition to, uh, of course, you increase nutrition by dilating the coronary artery so that it carries more blood to the ischemic area. That is so simple. You know, look, to, reduce, to increase the nutrition to the ischemic myocardium, you should dilate the coronary artery or you should do the thrombolysis so that more nutrition come. Donkey is happy. Secondly, you reduce the preload. Preload is the end diastolic volume on which myocardium has to contract so you should have reduced the preload what is preload preload is the end diastolic volume the volume of the blood at the end of the diastole on which the onset of systole work myocardium has to contract on the end diastolic volume if this volume is less then work of the myocardium is less thirdly systole has to generate enough tension to push the blood against a resistance of the arteriolar constriction what is afterload this heart is working against this resistance what is this resistance arteriolar. this is the total peripheral resistance arteriolar constriction so if your arterioles constrict too much this slope will go up donkey may fall down you get it and if there is arteriolar dilatation the slope will come down you understand it in the same way, if blood volume is increased, preload will increase. If venous return is more, preload is more. If venous return is less, preload is yes. less. Are you clear? Mm -hmm. Now, I will put donkey little bit on the side and talk about your real heart. Beautiful heart. We will just keep our example of donkey here. Right, this is your donkey going up. Ischemic donkey, weeping. And its legs are really in trouble. Right, and here is the preload. It is carrying. And this is the afterload, the resistance against which it is working. Is that right? So, now, we'll come to the real thing. And let me explain it to you. This diagram all of you should draw. This is the right heart. Here is your lung. 
and here is your left heart. Now what is really happening? Now we'll see how the anti general drugs should work, right? This is your vascular system in the periphery. Here is your aorta. Okay, I'll make it more simple diagram. This is your arterial tray. Here are arterioles. These are the arterioles going to the capillary beds. Is that right? These are different tissues, right? And here is your venous system. It's a very simple diagram. This blue light, blue system is your venous side. This red system is your arterial side. Is that right? And blood from this will go to the lungs. Their blood gets oxygenated, and oxygenated blood comes to left heart. Is it right? And of course we should not forget that here is your oxygenation business. Now we have to see first the management of, for example this may be liver, right? This is circulation maybe through GIT. This is circulation maybe through the skeletal muscle. Do you understand it? And look, these are arterioles, these are arteriolar smooth muscles. Is that right? And this is the venous side. Now, this is right heart of course, and there is left heart there. Now let's see what's happening in angina, classical angina. I told you in classical angina, there is a fixed obstruction there. Because there is fixed obstruction there, whenever heart work more, let's suppose this person is exerting or whenever he does a little bit of exertion or whenever there is little tachycardia, demand on oxygen increases but this point cannot dilate further. So it cannot provide further oxygen and this part of the myocardium, we can say this part of myocardium is vulnerable myocardium, right? Out of this, the most vulnerable is the innermost myocardium. Is that right? Now we will see how this problem start and how drugs can correct it. First lesson, what's wrong with this patient? Atherosclerotic lien is very advanced, maybe 80% of the occlusion. Whenever this person does a little bit exertion or whenever there is little bit tachycardia due to emotional fluctuation or sympathetic overflow, heart will increase its cardiac work, increased cardiac work will demand more oxygen but this point cannot provide extra oxygen, so dependent myocardium become ischemic and that produces the symptomatology of angina. And if this point is very severe, during one week, this patient may develop angina many times. Now how do you manage this angina? This is undernourished donkey. We have to help him, right? Now, one way is that we give the, listen, one way is that you reduce the venous return because this is the end diastolic volume and end diastolic volume is also called end diastolic pressure, right? End diastolic volume lead to end diastolic pressure in the cavity and that is also called preload. Now from today onward, every doctor should know very clearly what is preload. Preload is amount of the blood present in the ventricle on which ventricle has to start its squeezing action on which ventricle has to start its squeezing action or simply preload is the end diastolic volume, the volume on which ventricle has to contract, right? So it is the load on the myocardium before myocardium contract, before the myocardium start contracting. This is the load on myocardium. 
Now, one way is, now listen, whenever preload is more, you know the basic rule, Frank Starling's law. What is the Frank Starling law? More you stretch the myocardial fiber, more it contracts. Do you know this law? It means more you stretch, more you contract. What does it mean? It means more you stretch, more it contracts, more it demands oxygen. Now you develop the relationship of oxygen with. Now what is the stretching factor on the myocardium? And diastolic volume. If you have more preload or you have more end diastolic volume or you have more end diastolic pressure, it means there is more stretch in the myocardium. It means myocardium has to contract more strongly. It means it will demand less oxygen or more oxygen? More oxygen. More oxygen. Now, very simple technique. If somehow, we re okay, this is one problem that whenever there is more preload, there is demand, more demand for the oxygen. Do you understand it? Secondly, another thing which most of the doctors don't understand that when there is more end diastolic volume, there is more pressure in the cavity. When there is more pressure in the cavity, intraventricular intra ventricular cavity pressures are high whenever there is more end diastolic volume. And whenever this pressure is high, it will further compress this my inner myocardium and make it more vulnerable to ischemia. So it means that whenever there is a high end diastolic volume, there is higher pre-stretch on the myocardium, there is a higher work of the myocardium and there is a higher intracavity pressure and there is a higher compression on the deeper myocardium and further risk of ischemia. Now what do you do? You should do something, listen, you should give some pharmacological agent which reduce, reduces the preload. Now how do you reduce the preload? Now we are going to be merciful to this donkey. We are reducing this preload. How will reduce this preload? How will reduce the cardiac filling? Very simple. From where the blood is coming into heart? Blood is coming from the venous side. Blood is coming to the ventricular cavity from where? Venous side is maintaining the venous return and filling of the myocardium. Now, very simple technique. You give a drug which is venodilator. We dilate all the veins. If you give venodilator drugs, very strong venodilators, do you think Blood will now will be pulled into periphery or it will be coming back to the heart. Pa periphery. So one of the master drug techniques should be which we should give such drugs to such patient which are strong venodilators. So patients veins dilate. When veins dilate, then blood is pulled over here. Venous return is reduced. When venous return is reduced, then cardiac filling is Reduced and when cardiac filling is reduced, then preload is reduced. When preload is reduced, it means that and now the pre stretch on the myocardium is reduced. So contractility is reduced, oxygen demand is reduced, and myocardium may be happy even with reduced oxygen supply and ischemia may disappear. So this is so simple. All those drugs which are venodilators are preload reducers. Right, all those drugs which are venodilators are preload reducers. Right, they reduce the load from here, and of course your donkey should be happy. It is carrying less load. Secondly, another thing: look, donkey with more load will eat well, or donkey with less load is going to enjoy his food well. Le less load. So exactly this is what happened with myocardium, Doctor Hadayat. That when you reduce the preload. Donkey will eat better. How? Very simple. Look here. When you reduce the preload, intracavity pressures are less. When intracavity pressures are less, then compression on the deeper myocardial circulation is less. less. So even with less perfusion, better will be better flow will be coming to the deeper myocardium. You understand the beauty of this point? Number one, this is undernourished donkey, ischemic donkey. You reduce the load. Right, so that it can work well, and whenever you reduce the cavity pressure, even the compression on the deeper myocardium become less, and even with less flow, there will be better perfusion to deeper part. Is that right? So this will alleviate or terminate the ischemia or reduce the ischemia. So best way, one of the way, one of the strategy to reduce the work of the heart is you reduce the preload to reduce the end diastolic volume, you reduce the end diastolic pressure. When all these parameters are reduced, then stretch on the myocardium is 
reduced. Then according to Frank Starling law, tension is reduced and work of the heart is reduced, oxygen demand is reduced and maybe reduced oxygen demand is now able to meet with reduced supply. Here let's apply the Laplace's law as well, right? What was that? That pressure is directly proportional to the tension produced in the, the pressure in the cavity, the pressure which is generated in the cavity is directly proportional to the tension produced in the wall, tension produced in the wall and radius. Right. Now look at the beauty of it. Listen, listen, listen. Now it's my turn to explain. Your turn is in MCQs. I'm just developing a logic, logical thinking. Oh, my friends, you are all of you excited too much without any lady around. Listen. Uh, what I'm talking about, I don't know why my class is a men's show here. Now listen. What is happening? That let's suppose this uh, mean arterial pressure is 100 millimeter of mercury. So it means that left ventricle has to produce the pressure in the cavity of at least 100 to eject the blood. Is that right? Listen, listen. What, approximately, it is not normal, you know, ischemic now. So what we are talking about, that pressure, it has to generate this pressure. For this pressure, right, if we reduce the venous return, it means we reduce the radius. And when we reduce the radius, then heart has to produce, if same pressure, then it will produce more tension in the wall or less tension in the wall. Look, look again. Previously, when, when end diastolic volume was more, radius was more, and it was supposed, supposed to produce pressure of 100 unit. Pressure of 100 unit. When you give the, gave the venodilators, blood pooled here, less blood coming here, radius become less. When radius become less, then to produce the same pressure, it has to build more tension in the wall or less tension in the wall. So it has to be more contractility, less contractility. This is the beauty. That actually when end diastolic volume is reduced, preload is reduced, radius is reduced, then uh, to generate the same pressure, myocardium has to develop less tension. So it means the myocardium becomes more efficient because when there is less tension, when there is less tension, then less work is there, then less oxygen need is there. So we say heart becomes efficient because heart with, look, heart with larger radius for producing the pressure, given pressure, it needs larger tension. But when you reduce the preload, you reduce the end diastolic volume, actually with the lesser tension build up, it can give the same pressure output. So it means myocardium become more efficient. What is efficient myocardium? More efficient myocardium is, which is with less oxygen giving more pressures, generating more pressures. And inefficient ventricle is, which is with high tensions and high radius giving the pressure. So as you keep on increasing the radius of ventricle, it becomes inefficient ventricle. As you keep on decreasing the radius of the ventricle, it becomes more efficient. Do you understand it? So what really happens that when a patient is, there's, now you imagine there is a man in his mid 50s, heavy smoker, hypertensive, diabetic, recently fought with his own wife and girlfriend is not giving any attention, right? And he has financial stress going to the bank where probably money is far less, walking against the cold wind, right? What is happening? There is some tachycardia. Is exerting against the wind, right? And maybe uh, cold wind is producing arterial constriction. Heart has to pump against more resistance, so he develops ischemic chest pain. But he is intelligent man. His diagnosis was done one year back, and he often on suffer with angina. He immediately bring. He stop his walking, sit down on the sidewalk. From his pocket, he bring out the tablet of glycerol trinitrate, put it under the tongue. Within one to two minutes, this tablet will start working. What it will do? Don't tell me that it will go to the coronary artery and dilate. This patient was a patient of stable angina. He was having fixed obstruction. So even though nitrates can dilate the coronary artery, but dilatation will not be significant at the stenotic point. So it may not help much. The real help will come that within two, three minutes, rather than within one to one and a half minute, nitrates will dilate most of the veins 
So while he is sitting, veins will dilate or better to standing. So their pooling should be better. He is standing, the sublingual nitrate, veins will dilate, cardiac filling will be reduced, preload will be reduced, work of the heart will be reduced, intracavity pressures will be reduced, radius will be reduced, and eventually tensions to be generated are less, and oxygen demands of myocardium are less, and what will happen to him? His pain may disappear. But he can also rush, he doesn't need, he doesn't need the sublingual uh, Yeah, it depends on, listen, uh, now it's a very interesting question. He is simply taking rest can reduce the pain. Answer is yes. But for example, uh, he just rest and keep on remembering his wife and what she said in the morning and why she was not cooperative yesterday night. Tachycardia may continue. You know, you can reduce, you can make your body to rest. You cannot force your heart to rest. Heart has its own logic. Is that right? So, uh, secondly, he look at the bank where money is less and checks, he needs more. That is also precipitating tachycardia. Is that right? So, do you think that he can make everyone to rest in the world? <laughs> Answer is no. He can physically rest. Of course, it's helped. But still, if tachycardia is going on, then we have to have more drugs. One of them is, okay, if you take rest and pain disappear, it's very wonderful. But if it does not disappear, he should take sublingual nitrate. And even if not take, if he has taken 0.3 milligram of the sublingual nitrate, pain does not disappear in 3-4 minutes, what should you do? Take another dose of sublingual nitrate. Is that right? So that uh, he should make it sure somehow pain should disappear. And pain should not last more than 20 minutes. Right? He should be rushing to hospital, forget about the bank and the girlfriend and the wife. Right? Because now he is developing the risk for myocardial infarction. Now, listen. This is one way to help his uh, undernourished heart. So how do you have helped the donkey? One way to help the donkey was? Yes, please. Decrease the preload. Decrease the preload. Another way to help the donkey is to reduce the afterload. Now let me define what is afterload. Afterload is the resistance against which myocardium has to produce the stroke volume. Afterload is the impediment to the outflow of the left ventricle. And if aorta is healthy, then most of the impedance or the resistance is offered by the, most of the resistance is offered by what? Arteriole, degree of arteriolar constriction, total peripheral resistance is determined by the sum of the resistance of all arterioles in the body, systemic arterioles. If arterioles are very narrow, then heart has to generate, has to push the blood against higher pressure. And if arterioles are dilated, then heart has to generate against low pressure. Now please listen to me. Because again Laplace's law will come into the play. Look, if this patient has strong arteriolar constriction, if he has strong arteriolar constriction, he is again thinking about the unfortunate things in his life. Or maybe someone passed very beautiful and he become excited. Again, adrenaline come and arterioles constrict. Right? So if his arterioles are constricting too much, then to push the blood through the system, he need to produce more pressure or less pressure? More pressure. Let's suppose now he has to produce the pressure of 140 millimeter of mercury. It means in this patient, if there is strong arteriolar constriction, the pressure to be generated are more. Pressure requirements are more. And if there is too much arteriolar constriction, it means donkey is working against higher slope. Of course, more chances to slip. More chances, it, it should need more energy. So if there is arteriolar constriction, it has to generate higher pressure. If it has to generate higher pressure with the given radius, it has to have less tension or it has to produce more tension? More. It means whenever there is a significant arteriolar constriction, then for the left heart to generate the perfusion through most of the body, systemic circulation, to maintain good pressure, right, it has to maintain good tension. And when it has to increase the tension, it means it has to increase its work. And when it has to increase its work, its oxygen demand is more. As I told you, whenever there is arterial constriction, this point move like this. Resistance become more. Now donkey has to travel this. It needs more power and energy or less power and energy? 
more. So its oxygen demand will be more. more. Right? So how you will help this patient? Another way to help this donkey is that do arterial dilatation. Give a drug which will dilate the arteriole. If you give a drug which can dilate the arterioles, then the resistance against which it has to work has gone decrease. decrease. Now look at this donkey, how happy is it? Even though there is back breaking, but still he is happy. Why? Because preload has been reduced. At the top, you have given arteriolo dilator, right? So we can say that this was the function of veno dilator. And this movement, that this has moved into this direction, this is a function of arteriolo dilator. Is that right? So when you give arteriolo dilator, the resistance of blood, resistance offered to the blood to move from arterial tree to the capillary system and venous system has been reduced. So pressure will drop in this area and when pressure in arterial tree will drop, then it has to generate less pressure and has to generate less tension to maintain the cardiac output. Is that right? So work of the heart will be? Less. Less. And when work of the heart is less, then of course oxygen need is? Less. less. And when oxygen lead is, need is less, then even with this stenotic plaque, little bit oxygen coming may be enough for the myocardium which is working less. Is that right? So what are the best way to help that donkey? Number one, give venodilator and reduce preload. Number two, give arteriolo dilator and reduce Resistance. after load. To reduce after load. When preload and after load is reduced, it means that work of the heart is reduced. Even malnourished heart will not cry much and not much in general cries. Is that clear? So what is the best arteriolo dilator? Answer is calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers. Is that right? Calcium channel blockers are wonderful arteriolo dilator. And some of them also reduce the activity in the heart. I will go into detail later that nifedipine and related drugs are very good arteriolo dilator. And Vrapamil is actually also reducing heart in another way, hard work in another way. Let me tell you how. Now another way. Look here. Yes. One question. You all, these, all this thing you are talking about uh, classical angina? Yeah. That's on. Right. We are still talking about classical angina. Now, you have reduced the preload, you have reduced the afterload. Now donkey is very heavy, happily singing, whistling and going up and down. You can do more mercy to the donkey. How? You should reduce the total number of visits ups and down. You should reduce the heart rate. If you reduce the heart rate, right? Right? If you reduce, if you reduce, not digitalis. It is, it is going to kill him because digitalis will increase contractility and demand will be more. Now look, not digitalis, forget it. Now what we are talking about, that we have to reduce the total cycles per minute. That will also make the donkey happy. If you are donkey, you will be happy under these circumstances when your total cycles are reduced. So we should give some drug which is negatively chronotropic, which is negatively chronotropic. And negatively chronotropic drugs should be inhibiting SA node. The drugs should be inhibiting SA node. Right? Let's suppose here is your heart, ischemic heart. You want to reduce the heart rate. And if you want to reduce the heart rate, right, you can use two types of drug. Let's remain focused on this. You know, SA node produces depolarization which is under calcium dependent. This calcium SA node has calcium dependent depolarization. So if you give calcium channel blockers, what will happen? That calcium current in SA node will decrease. Total number of action potentials produced by SA node will be reduced. Is that right? And that will produce negative chronotropy. That will produce negative chronotropy. Or other thing is, who is the stimulant to SA node? is epinephrine or norepinephrine, endogenous. You know endogenous catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine stimulate 
the SA naught through beta 1 receptors. So another way that don't let the donkey run too much, let the donkey walk comfortably, right? How? To reduce the heart rate. To reduce the heart rate, one way is you give calcium channel blocker. Other way is you protect the heart from the action of endogenous catecholamines. To protect the heart from the action of endogenous catecholamines. So these endogenous catecholamine work on the heart through beta 1 receptor. Because they work through beta 1 receptor, why don't you give beta blockers? Another group of drug will be beta blocker. Beta blocker act on the SA node and reduce heart rate. And calcium channel blocker also work on the SA node and reduce heart rate. Right? Negative chronotropic action. Secondly, you know myocardial cells, their contractility depend on calcium loading. You know it or not? Myocardial cells contractility depends on calcium loading. Plus, this calcium loading may be through voltage gated calcium channels or this calcium loading may be influenced by beta 1 receptors, adrenergic receptors. You know, beta 1 adrenergic receptors load the calcium into myocardial cells or calcium is also triggered into myocardium during the plateau phase through the voltage gated calcium channels, L type calcium channels. You know it? Okay. Now, calcium either goes through the, what is this channel? Calcium channel, L type calcium channel or B catecholamine stimulate the beta 1 adrenergic receptor and these receptors will activate, you must be knowing, activate G stimulatory which will stimulate adenyl cyclase that will increase intracellular cyclic AMP that will drive protein kinase A which will phosphorylate the calcium channels and further calcium loading. Do you think this heart, we have to reduce the work of the heart in angina or increase the work of heart? Reduce. We want to reduce the work of heart. One way to reduce the work of the heart is reduce the calcium loading to the myocardium so that it contract with less tension. So it work less and demand less oxygen. So you can give here, what should be the drug here my friend? Calcium channel blocker or what should be the drug here? Beta blockers. You get it? Now you look at it that those calcium channel blockers which work on the heart like Vrapamil or Diltazem, they can reduce the heart rate and reduce the contractile stroke volume and reduce the cardiac output and reduce the work of the heart. You are understanding? And that also helps in angina. So how many ways to help the angina look? Now look carefully to me. Number one, we want to help this ischemic donkey. Reduce the load. Reduce the preload. What is the drug now? To reduce the preload, what is the name of the drug? Venodilators. Reduce the preload, like nitrates. Or you reduce the afterload. What is that? Calcium channel blockers. Or ask the donkey, please don't run, slow down, slow down, no hurry, no worry and don't forget to see the flowers. Right? Heart should be slowed down. For slowing of the action, uh, slowing of the rate and slowing of contractility. This is achieved by direct action of beta blockers and calcium channel blockers on the heart. Is that right? Any question? So this was just basic information, the basic strategies used in management of classical angina. Is that right? Uh, after the break, we'll go into detail of every group of drug. We'll talk first in detail about the nitrates, then we'll talk about calcium channel blockers and beta blockers, right? Now we got the concept. Yeah. Now you have the concept. Now I'll teach you what are the drugs. So by the discussion which we have learned that there are three drugs used in classical management of angina. These three drug groups are nitrates. There are beta blockers. There are calcium channel blocker. Calcium channel blocker. These are the three classical drugs, right? In the management of angina. I will explain the advantages and disadvantages of these drugs. 
But there are other things which are also important in the management of angina, right? For example, I told you, in the long-term management of angina, we should modify, modify the risk factor, risk factor for the development of, for development of atherosclerosis. Is that right? For example, if someone has stable angina, he should stop smoking or if he is hypertensive or diabetic, these things should be managed. If he has dyslipidemias, those should be managed, right? Sedentary lifestyle should be abandoned. Patients should start physically active lifestyle, right? So that his, what should happen? The further progression of atherosclerotic disease should be reduced. And even by modifying these risk factor, uh, some the, some regression in the atherosclerotic lesions has also been seen. One thing. Second thing, which is very important, we should take the drugs which are plaque stabilizers. Do you know the group of drugs which can stabilize the plaques, atherosclerotic plaques? Plaque stabilizers. Yes. What is that drug? Plaque stabilizers. The most wonderful drug in this group are statins. Statins. So, in the, for the long run management, you have to manage the risk factors as well as you have to use start using the statins, which are not only reducing the not only their cholesterol lowering drug, right? But statins also reduce the progression of the plaque development either under the influence of statin, the unstable plaque right gradually stabilize or the stable plaque has less chance to undergo acute changes. Is that right? So it means if a patient who is having stable angina and he has uh, some atherosclerotic lesions in coronary artery, if he is on the long term use of statins, then there is less chance that these stable atheromas or plaques may go under acute changes. Third thing that especially those patients who have undergone unstable angina, you have to give antiplatelet drugs. Antiplatelet and antithrombotic or thrombolytic drugs or antithrombotic drugs. Right? Now these are long term management. Is it clear? That risk factor management, you stabilize the plaques by giving the statins and you give long term aspirin juice or other antiplatelet drugs so the chances of formation of platelet aggregates is less, right? But classical management remains around the nitrates, beta blockers and calcium channel blocker. In today's discussion, we will concentrate more on nitrates, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers and we will have a separate full lecture on antiplatelet drugs and fibrinolytic or thrombolytic drugs. Is that right? Now, let's concentrate on nitrates. First of all, I will tell you how the nitrates work and what are the nitrate drugs. These are also called nitrovasodilators, right? One of the term which is coined is nitrovasodilators or simply nitrates, nitrates. Now the drug which are present in this group of nitrate, they are glyceryl trinitrate, glyceryl trinitrate, right? Then another drug which is present in this group is isosorbide dinitrate, isosorbide dinitrate. And another important drug in this group is isosorbide mononitrate, that is isosorbide mononitrate. What is the TPN? Glyceryl trinitrate. Glyceryl with three nitrates, trinitrate. Isosorbide? Mononitrate. Now, glyceryl trinitrate, how it is given to the patient? In which forms? Most commonly, it is given sublingual or buccal sprays or oral pellets, right? Why we give it 
in the oral cavity. The reason being that if you take orally glycerol trinitrate through the GIT, when it goes to the liver, in the liver, this drug is inactivated. Because glycerol trinitrate is having a very high first pass effect. First pass effect means when a drug is taken orally, when this drug is passing first time through the liver, most of it is inactivated or destroyed. So glycerol trinitrate has a very high, very high ratio of very strong first pass effect. That is why when you take a tablet of glycerol trinitrate, right, you just put it in the oral cavity under the tongue. From there it will melt and dissolve. And this dissolve will go through lingual veins of course into the uh, veins from the head and neck into spiro vena cava. So it will go to the systemic circulation without passing through the liver. Is that right? When you take this drug sublingually or in the oral cavity as buccal spray, this will go from the veins of the head and neck, drain into superior vena cava, going to the right heart, pump to the pulmonary circulation, drug goes to the left heart and through the left heart, drug is pumped into a whole systemic circulation. In this way, we get the drug reaching to the systemic veins without passing through the liver. So that is why within one to two minutes, this sublingual dose will start its action. That if there's a person who gets intermittent angina, right? <coughs> he should keep, if a person get intermittent exertional angina, this person, person should keep a supply of tablets of glycerol trinitrate. And he can use it in two ways. Number one, whenever angina precipitate, he can take the tablet sublingually or he can use these tablets prophylaxically. That whenever he knows there are situations which will provoke angina, right? Prophylactic use. For example, he is going two flights of stair. So before going those flights of stair, he should take nitrates and then go up. Is that right? This reduces the, on the, you can say, total number of attacks per week. Is that right? So uh, glycerol trinitrate, which is given sublingually, tablet or spray, right, it start action within two minutes and it continues its action for about 30 minutes. Onset of action is two minutes and it continues its action up to 25 to 30 minutes, right, duration. Is that right? This is one thing. Second thing which is important is that there are oral sustained release tablets also, oral sustained release tablets also for nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin or glycerol trinitrate, they are one and the same thing. It is also called nitroglycerin. It is one and the same thing, right? Another is that now there are available oral sustained release tablets, they start their action uh, within 30 minutes and action continues up to 6 hours. 6 to 8 hours. Oral sustained release. Release tablets, right? They start their action within 30 minutes and they continue their action up to 6 to 8 hours. <coughs> it is minutes. Of course, then you can understand. If angina is already starting, you have to give sublingual tablets. Is that right? Because it will start action within one to two minutes, right? Because if you take oral sustained release, right, it will take 30 minutes to start. And of course, in acute phase, it is not good. It is for prophylactic use. Here I want to tell one thing, attention please. If someone gets angina attack only very occasionally, he should keep glycerol trinitrate tablet with him <coughs> and use them as required. And use them as required. But if someone is getting angina more frequently, then he should take the nitrates more regularly on daily basis. Is that right? For example, yeah, again, someone <coughs> who is developing angina very occasionally, he should keep the supply of, you can say, uh, sublingual tablets and whenever he needs, he can put one tablet either prophylactically or during the acute attack, right? But he should not take a regular tablets of 
nitrates. But if there's another person who is <coughs> developing angina of exertion very regularly, very, uh, very frequently, then he must take nitrates on a regular basis. And when he is taking nitrates for regular basis, either he will take the oral sustained release or he can take transdermal application. Transdermal application. Patch? Yeah. These are transdermal patch or uh, you apply the ointment on the skin. You know, you take from the tube, bring a little bit ointment and apply it on, uh, you can say, one inch to two inch area. Right? From there it will be absorbed and it will be going to the blood. Right? This transdermal application, this also start action within 30 minutes. It also starts action within 30 minutes and continues its action from 8 to 12 hours. Now one thing note here, as far as onset of action, very fast and termination of action also very fast is sublingual applications. But when you take it orally or transdermally, it takes about half an hour to start the action and it takes many hours of duration for which the drug remain active in the body. So this was about the nitroglycerin. Now few words about isosorbide dinitrate. Now isosorbide dinitrate can also be taken orally and sublingually. It may have sublingual as well as oral preparations, right? Sublingual preparation of the isosorbide dinitrate, they start action within five minutes and it continues up to, it start within five minutes and it continues up to one hour. So again, in emergency, preferably you should have nitroglycerin. If it is not available, you can take isosorbide dinitrate tablet sublingually, but it will act about one hour. Is that right? And if you are taking the regular drug, then you can take the oral slow release tablet and that start of oral slow release tablet and that start action within 30 minutes, right? And terminates its action within eight hours. Is it clear? It may terminate section within 8 hours or around 8 hours. Then there is isosorbide dinitrate, right? And in isosorbide dinitrate, the tablets are taken orally. Mononitrate. Sorry, please correct it. I, now we are going to discuss mononitrate, right? Isosorbide mononitrate. And isosorbide mononitrate, these are oral extended release tablets. And these oral extended release tablets start their action within 30 minutes, right? But it continues its action for a long time, sometimes up to 12 hours. 12 hours, right? Oral extended release. Uh, look, yeah. Slow release, it is releasing the product up to 8 hours. Extended uh, release means it is going beyond that. Actually, it depends on how the drug has been compressed and what are the physical nature of the drug. Is that right? For example, a tablet which you can dissolve very rapidly in the GIT, right? It will be released into blood for shorter time. But another tablet which is present in the GIT but molecules are too much compressed and they very gradually uh, dissolve, they will take longer time and they, to dissolve and keep on releasing the product to blood for longer time. Do you get me or not? Right? Now here I want to tell you one thing extremely important. That is that you cannot continue get the patient protected with nitrates 24 hourly because if nitrates are used for longer time they lose their action. You don't know this thing, you must know. What really happens, if you give nitrates more than 12 hours or 18 hours continuously, after that efficacy of nitrates is lost. What is the mechanism? They are not very clear, but there is something very important. For example, this is the smooth muscle of a vein or artery. How the nitrates work? The nitrates go into this smooth muscle, nitrate drug, and these nitrate drugs release their nitric oxide. And later on I will explain how this nitric oxide produces venodilatation or arteriolodilatation. 
it's a very strong venodilator and it's slight arteriolo dilator as well you can say venodilation is like this in compared to arterial dilation at therapeutic doses so why because smooth muscle of veins can release nitri nitric oxide more effectively from the drug and smooth muscle of artery attention please if drug is going into smooth muscle of vein as well as in the smooth muscle of artery drug itself is not active from the drug we have to release the active product what is the active product nitric, nitric, nitric oxide, oxide. Nitric. not nitrous oxide nitrous oxide is you know <laughs> anesthetic yeah. agent yeah. this is nitric oxide so nitric oxide is one of the very important you can say intracellular signaling molecule for the smooth muscle it's so important that the person who discovered its role they were awarded with nobel prize is that right just to tell it's so important otherwise let's come back now why this drug is stronger venodilator and weak arteriolo dilator answer is that this drug goes within the venous smooth muscle and arterial smooth muscle in the same amount but venous smooth muscles are more efficient in extracting the nitric oxide from the drug molecule but arterial smooth muscle are poorly extracting the nitric oxide from the parent molecule drug so due to this reason when uh, nitrate concentration in the venous blood and arterial blood is same but still venodilatation is more and arterial dilatation is less, less because uh, there is more release of nitric oxide in the venous smooth muscle less release of nitric oxide in arterial smooth muscle this is one point secondly they believe the enzymes the enzymes which help in release of nitric oxide from nitrates right these enzymes actually develop the phenomenon of these are enzymes with sulfhydryl proteins they show the phenomenon of tolerance what really happens that if you keep on providing the drug right within 15 to 20 hours around 14 15 hours of regular application of a presence of the nitrates then these enzymes stop working and they are unable to uh, release the nitric oxide from nitrates your understanding okay i will explain it again for example i'm giving you nitrates every 8 hourly and i'm covering you nit with the nitrate for 24 hours nitrate will keep venodilator very well for about 16 hours after that nitrates mediated venodilatation is lost why because the enzyme which was supposed to extract nitric oxide out of the drug these enzymes stop working and these enzymes need a gap of 6 to 8 hours daily to restart their function you understand it that is why the best way to treat the patient badly is give the nitrates regularly every patient who is on nitrate daily should be on 6 to 8 hours or 10 hours nitrate free interval so that tolerance does not develop what is your concept of tolerance that is you keep on giving the drug regularly right the pharmacological action of the drug is lost after some time right body start tolerating the drug right so nitrates show a very high degree of tolerance within 12 to 15 hours or 16 hours is that right now why i am highlighting this thing because whenever you use nitrates for your patients always provide some nitrate free interval, interval. is that right so that tolerance should not develop now you must be thinking that patient may get severe angina during the nitrate free interval and don't forget there is the other drug beta blocker that's the beauty of it that you give the nitrate with beta blocker in cases where where angina attacks are very frequent so that when patient is not under nitrate protection patient should be under protection of beta blockers i will explain how the beta blockers protect the heart am i clear so point number one nitrate drug show a strong tendency to sh uh, for the 
mechanism of tolerance, right? Every patient who is on regularly nitrates should have at least eight hours of nitrate-free interval so that uh, mechanisms which keep the nitrate functional, right? Nitrate mechanisms functional, they should not become tolerant. Is that right? And one way to manage the patient during the nitrate free interval is that patient may be put, if he is having high frequency of attacks, patient may be put on the beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. Am I clear? Number two, look, exertional angina. Exertional angina is more in the daytime or at night? Exertional in the daytime. In the daytime until you are not doing something very special at night. Right? So, most of the patient, no, these are very important. If you are going to do something special, you have to take special care of yourself. So, most of the patient, most of the patient who have exertional angina, right? The risk of angina is during the daytime when you become emotionally upset, so you become physically exerting, right? So, the nitrate interval, nitrate free interval in these patients should be provided when? At night. So, you have to remember. That patient who display the strong exertional angina or classical angina or stable angina, nitrate free interval should be at night. For example, they should use nitrate patches. In the daytime for 12 hours, they should use the patch. For 12 hours, they should remove the patch. Because when you apply the transdermal application, these patches, they are constantly uh, releasing the nitrates into blood. Right? But after 12 hours, you should remove the Patch because if you keep the patches for 24 hours, patches will uh, these uh, drug will lose its efficacy. Am I clear? But if you talk about uh, variant angina or prince metal angina, prince metal angina has a high chance to be precipitated in morning hours. Right when adrenaline level in the blood is high, catecholamine level. So for them, nitrate free interval should be in the evening time. So you have to intelligently design the treatment for a given patient, nitrate treatment. Am I clear? Yes. So unstable and prince metal. Uh, we are not talking about unstable right now. We are talking about classical angina and, in yes. classical means stable and prince metal. Classical angina is related with exertion, right? So usually patient should be covered with nitrates in the daytime and because most of the people don't exert much during sleep, so I must say that nitrate-free interval should be provided at their sleeping time. Yes. Is that right? But when we talk about uh, a patient on the prince metal angina, prince metal angina is usually is more frequent in the morning because there is fluctuating coronary artery tone and usually in the morning adrenergic supply is more. Is that right? And there are more chances that patient will precipitate prince metal angina in the morning hours. Due to that reason, we don't give them, uh, you can say, nitrate free interval at night or early morning. We give them nitrate free interval in the evening times. They get a tablet before sleeping and they take a tablet just after wake up. They miss the tablet in the evening. Am I clear? Or noon? Now listen, another thing. About these nitrates, there is a very interesting phenomenon of historical interest when we talk about nitrates. You know, nitrates were very commonly used in ammonium nitrates and other drugs when you are making explosives. And in Second World War, in those years, when uh, people were working in the factories where they were building explosives, right, workers develop a very special type of syndrome. They developed a disease called Monday disease. Monday, Monday disease. Monday disease. What was this Monday disease? Actually what was happening to these patients that after the weekend enjoying a lot when they come on the factory if there are 1000 worker most of them develop severe headaches and flushing and dizziness and after one two days it will be okay. Right now they came to know what is the mechanism. Actually uh, in those factories in those times uh, nitrates were not properly contained in the instruments. So the workers who were getting, they were also inhaling nitrate. Many nitrates are volatile, like amyl nitrate is fully volatile. And you can say other nitrates which we are using these days, like isosorbate dinitrate, they are solid at room temperature. So those volatile nitrates were going to their circulation. So these patients all the week, right, they were getting good nitrate inadvertently. Is that right? 
du du during the weekend their enzymes recover and when they come in the monday morning get the nitrates enzymes will convert the nitrate into nitric oxide and they will develop severe vasodilatation and when vessels in head and neck will undergo vasodilatation they will develop severe headache and flushing and when most of the veins will dilate venous pooling will occur venous return will reduce cardiac output will drop and they will develop postural hypotension and dizziness but within monday and tuesday they will develop tolerance to the drug the rest of the days there will be no complication you are getting me so every monday or whenever they come from holidays they develop severe headache and with that they develop flushing and they develop postural hypertension and all the staff was getting almost right and during as week is uh, advancing uh, these symptoms will reduce is that clear so this was one uh, problem which was called monday disease yes but on the weekend when the symptoms now i'm going to tell you many of these patient used to get what dependence on nitrates especially some of these workers who are having some degree of atherosclerosis all the week they don't get angina these workers and on weekends they get angina and they blame it to their family situation is that right so i just wanted to tell you this some something interesting about the nitrates right that there are two concepts related with the nitrates number one was monday disease number two was nitrate dependence monday disease mean that when the monday they will come they will get the nitrates and produce lot of nitric oxide in the body and develop toxicity of nitrate right but as the week will go by the enzymes will become uh, you can say non functional and now nitrates will not be converted into nitric oxide and monday symptoms will disappear right and some of the patient will even develop nitrate dependence they all the week they don't get any anginal attack if they are having a tendency for angina so they were getting the therapy of angina in advertently from their uh, unknowingly they were getting the therapeutic doses of nitrates and when they go for holidays they develop the ischemic heart disease symptomatology right isn't it interesting yes right now i will come to this fact that how the nitrates exactly work at molecular level <coughs> right how the nitrate relax the smooth muscles i did not talk about the molecular basis that how the nitrates relax the venous smooth muscle and to some degree arterial smooth muscle now what we will do first we will understand the normal mechanism of smooth muscle contraction and then we will talk about how nitrates alter those smooth muscle contraction it can relax the smooth muscle the veins there will be veno dilation and if they do relax a little bit smooth muscle of arteries they will produce arterial dilatation let's see at molecular level first physiology and then pharmacology first what is the physiology of smooth muscle contraction and relaxation and how the nitrates modify let's suppose here the smooth muscle it's really very big one right <clears throat> now first i'll talk about how the normal smooth muscle contraction occur you know smooth muscle can also get calcium from outside and this calcium can also release the calcium from yes endoplasmic reticulum of smooth muscle endoplasmic reticulum of smooth muscle is a good store of calcium so calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, i should call it endoplasmic reticulum because sarcoplasmic reticulum is a term which is used for myocardial endoplasmic reticulum right now when this calcium come out this calcium bind with a protein and this protein is called yeah what is the name of this protein calmodulin what is it called calmodulin right so this calmodulin is a protein which is modulated by calcium so when calcium bind with calmodulin what calmodulin is this complex is going to do i think diagram is a bit dirty but i never made it with this intention so calcium will bind with the calmodulin and calcium calmodulin complex it will do a very important thing that this complex will activate an enzyme and that enzyme is called myosin 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 light chain light chain kinase what is the name of this enzyme myosin light chain 
kinase. And what is the function of this uh, enzyme? Myosin light chain kinase, right? Actually, calcium calmodulin complex activate the myosin light chain kinases. And what is the function of myosin light chain kinase? Actually, myosin light chain kinase lead to phosphorylation of myosin light chains. Let's suppose this is the, you can say, sarcomere type arrangement. It's not truly a sarcomere in smooth muscle. But let's suppose these are actins and what is here? Myosin. This is the heavy chain of myosin and here these are the light chains of myosin. Now you know that when this myosin heads and light chains myosin interact with the actin, they will produce contraction of smooth muscle, right? These are the myosin binding actin sites. These are myosin binding actin site. Remember, there is no troponin here and there is no tropomyosin. So don't confuse it with the skeletal muscle or and or myocardial muscle. In smooth muscle, there is no troponin or tropomyosin. In smooth muscle, the special mechanism of contraction is that myosin light chain kinases will lead to phosphorylation of, they will lead to phosphorylation of light chains. So phosphates are binding with the light chains. And when these phosphates are binding with the light chains, then light chains develop. These phosphorylated light chains have a capacity to bind with actin. Now listen carefully. That how then actin myosin will start binding and contraction will start. Is it right? This is the normal physiology that calcium level rises into, into intracytosol. Rising calcium, this is also having calcium dependent contraction but different mechanism. Here is no troponin. You know in the heart, in myocardial cell, calcium bind with troponin. Here calcium bind with calmodulin. Calmodulin activate myosin light chain kinases. Myosin light chain kinases lead to phosphorylation of, yes, they will lead to phosphorylation of light chains and when light chains are phosphorylated right what really happens that light chains develop the capability to interact with the with the actin and contraction will start is that right this is normal physiology of contraction now relaxation how the smooth muscle relax how the smooth muscle relax for this purpose there is a monkey like enzyme here and this monkey enzyme what it is doing it will snatch away the phosphates from here right what is this enzyme doing it has some transplanted here also right so this monkey enzyme what is the function of this that this enzyme when is activated and this activation will lead to dephosphorylation or removal of phosphate from light chain. Because it removes the phosphate, what should be its name? Myosin light chain phosphatases. It's so simple. It is myosin light chain, yes, phospha, phosphatases, phosphatase. So it means that when you want, listen now carefully. The central concept is, the central concept is phosphorylation and dephosphorylation of myosin light chain. When we want contraction of smooth muscle, then we phosphorylate the light chains. When we want relaxation of smooth muscle, we dephosphorylate the light chains. Am I clear? Now smooth muscles have intrinsically high level of myosin light chain phosphatases. Is that right? So contraction dependent depends on constant action of myosin light chain kinases. As long as, now listen carefully, as long as smooth muscle has high level of calcium, for that much duration, myosin light chain kinases are activated through calcium calmodulin complex. As far as, as long as myosin light chain kinases are activated, they will keep the light chains, light chains phosphorylated and uh, phosphorylated light chains will keep on intermittently interacting with the my actin myosin and producing sarcomere. 
as soon as look calcium level become less for example more calcium is not released rather calcium is pumped back into its stores or calcium from here is thrown out so as soon as calcium become low calmodulin has dissociation with the calcium calmodulin is inactive it does not activate myosin light chain kinases and myosin light chain kinases do not phosphorylate when they stop phosphorylating actually dephosphorylation continues through this phosphatases and smooth muscle relaxes now look one way to relax the smooth muscle is kill this thing if you want to relax the smooth muscle you actually uh, inhibit what is this myosin yes light chain kinases if you inhibit the myosin light chain kinases what will happen relaxation right that uh, light chains will be no more light chains will be no more phosphorylated is that right yes. now the thing is that how we do it the drugs answer is nitrates how the nitrates inhibit this enzyme you get me because this enzyme is going to produce what thing light chain kinases and precipitate contraction now let's see how it is working let's suppose the nitrates come nitrate drug come into the smooth muscle nitrates nitrates release which enzyme uh, which sub active substance nitric oxide right you remember there was some enzyme here which was responsible sulfhydryl containing proteins which are responsible to release the nitrate from nit uh, release the nitric oxide from nitrate and these are the enzyme which display the phenomenon of tolerance but anyway if patient has these enzymes active nitrates will release nitric oxide nitric oxide will bind with a special type of enzyme here and that enzyme is present into cytosol what is the name of this enzyme yes nitric oxide will bind to the what is this this enzyme what is the name of this enzyme yes please this is cytosolic guanylyl cyclase what is the name of this enzyme cytosolic guanylyl cyclase right when nitrates bind with cytosolic guanylyl cyclase what this is going to do it will convert yes it will convert what is the function of this enzyme yes it will convert gtp into cyclic gmp it is not adenylyl cyclase it is guanylyl cyclase you know adenylyl cyclase convert atp if it is adenylyl cyclase it will convert atp into cyclic amp but this is not adenylyl cyclase what is this guanylyl cyclase so this guanylyl cyclase convert gtp into cyclic gmp when cyclic gmp levels are high right this will bind with a special type of enzyme and this enzyme is called what is the name of this enzyme this is protein kinase g what is the name of this protein kinase g why we call it protein kinase g because this enzyme is a protein right and it has a kinase activity kinase mean phosphorylating activity and its phosphorylating activity depend on gmp cyclic gmp so this is called protein kinase g and what is the function of protein kinase g you know what it is going to do protein kinase g it is going to inhibit the action of light chain right this is going to inhibit the action of
right myosin light chain and how it does by phosphorylating the light chain look at it it has put what it has put phosphates in the mouth of light chain kinases when light chain kinases itself phosphorylated it is inhibited remember most of the protein on phosphorylation are activated some of the proteins on phosphorylation are inhibited myosin light chain is one of the protein that when this protein is phosphorylated it become inhibited now you recap it nitrates come into smooth muscle release nitric oxide nitric oxide stimulates cytosolic guanylyl cyclase that convert gtp into cyclic gmp when intracellular cyclic gmp become high it activate protein kinase g protein kinase g does phosphorylation of phosphorylation of myosin light chain and when myosin light chain gets phosphorylated right then myosin light chain is non functional and inhibited and when myosin light chain is inhibited there is no more phosphorylation of myosin light chains and phosphatase will lead to dephosphorylation and when uh, phosphatase mediated myosin light chain phosphatase mediated dephosphorylation is not compensated by phosphorylation by this then dephosphorylated light chains fail to interact with actin and smooth muscle relax this is the molecular basis of action of nitrate and after that we'll recap a little bit what is the physiological basis of nitrate we have already discussed a little bit how nitrate basically reduce manage the angina okay i will just repeat it in few words that once smooth muscle the veins are relaxed what will happen we know venous pooling and venous return to heart is reduced preload in the heart is reduced and preload on the heart is reduced pre stretch on myocardium is reduced contractility of myocardium is reduced and oxygen demand is reduced number 1 number 2 when venous return is reduced pre end diastolic volume is reduced intra cavity pressures are less so there less compression on subendocardial myocardium so slightly increased blood flow third nitrates do produce direct arteriolar dilatation to some degree in the coronary arteries but when there is fixed stenotic layer right there is only slight improvement because when there is fixed stenotic layer if it has a little bit associated vasospasm that may be relieved but there is a very special mechanism how in the heart it helps look here this is ischemic myocardium now look at this carefully this is the major coronary trunk coming and this is divided into two branches here let's suppose this branch has atherosclerotic lesions let's concentrate on it this branch has atherosclerotic lesions now what will happen that this area will become ischemic this is the dependent area is it right but outer area has a good perfusion outer area has a now these three vessels these are called collateral supply because main supply was coming from this was the main supply to this myocardial piece and if there were chronic ischemia the ischemic area keep on releasing the angiogenic growth factor so what really happens that if from repeated ischemia ischemic area releases angiogenic growth factor and over the time there will be development of collateral to the ischemic zone collateral supply now look here when you will give nitrates this stenotic point may not dilate significantly but actually the collateral pathways may dilate and there may be extra blood coming from the collateral as well so that may also help in termination of angina so how the angina is terminated by nitrates i've discussed three mechanism rather i will discuss four let's recap do you remember four or not most important single most important point you should mention strong venodilatation strong reduction in end diastolic volume and preload and and reduced cardiac work this is one mechanism second reduction in intra cavity pressures so there is less extra vascular compression on the deeper myocardial vessels 
सो बैटर परफ्यूजन थर्ड नाइट्रेट कैन डायलेट द कोलेट्रल पाथवेज एंड प्रोवाइड एडिशनल ब्लड टू द स्किमिक एरिया फोर्थ नाइट्रेट एट हायर डोजेज कैन डू एट लीस्ट टू सम आर्टीरियोलो डायलेटेशन एंड इफ देर इज इवन लिटल आर्टीरियोलो डायलेटेशन दैट हेल्प इन रिडक्शन ऑफ आफ्टर लोड दैट हेल्प इन रिडक्शन ऑफ द रेजिस्टेंस अगेंस्ट विच माओकार्डियम इज कॉन्ट्रैक्टिंग दैट फर्दर रिड्यूस द वर्क ऑफ द हार्ट एंड रिड्यूस फर्दर हेल्प इन रिडक्शन ऑफ स्कीमिया इज दैट राइट सो दिस वर मालिकुलर मैकेजम ऑफ हाउ नाइट्रेट वर्क एंड when we talk about preload mechanisms and we talk about how uh, that is that is physiological mechanisms how the nitrates work let's have a break now Perfect. now we are going to discuss the side effects or adverse effects of nitrates right now the side effects of nitrate mainly stem from exaggerated pharmacological actions nitrates and side effects of nitrates right or adverse effects number one thing that nitrates produce severe headache and this is the most common side effect of nitrates that they produce headache and they also produce facial flushing now why let me tell you why they produce headache remember all the drugs which are strong vasodilators can do have a capacity to produce headache i'll tell you this headache is a very special type of headache we call it throbbing headache now let me tell you the mechanism of throbbing headache let's suppose this is your cranial cavity and these are the vessels which are going through foramina to the cranial cavity these are the artery meningeal arteries or other arteries which are passing through the foramina to the central nervous system and you know that internal side of the cavity cranial cavity is lined by dura mater and this dura mater makes a sleeve around these arteries right this dura mater makes a sleeve around these arteries and this dural sleeve which extend along these arteries now actually listen very carefully this point dura mater point these are very very rich in pain receptors these are very rich in pain receptor these dural sleeves they are having lot of pain receptors now when you produce arterial or dilatation arteries are dilating constricting dilating with every pulse during every systolic pulse now listen carefully with every systolic expansion arteries hammer the pain receptors against the bone and that produces severe throbbing headache what really happens that all those arteries all those drugs which produce strong arterial dilatation right if they produce arterial dilatation of the vessels which are passing through meninges these vessels are surrounded by meningeal dural sleeves and these dural sleeves are very very rich in pain receptors so when our arteries are significantly dilated during every systolic expansion arteries hit the dural sleeve with pain receptors against the bone and that produces severe throbbing headache headache with every pulse is that right this is the basic mechanism how headache is produced with nitrates one of my teachers used to say if a patient is taking nitrates and develop headache tell the patient we are sure drug is original drug has started its function right so as drug uh, reach to the meningeal artery meningeal artery start dilating or vessels uh, passing through the foramina cranial foramina dilate and beat the dura metal pain receptors against the bone with that arteries of the face and skin are more sensitive to the action of the nitrates due to that reason many people when they take nitrates not only they develop severe headache but with that they also develop dilatation of facial arteries and facial blood flow and they develop facial flushing is that right 
Then another extremely important side effect, most common side effect was headache. And most important side effect is postural hypotension. Now let me tell you what is postural hypotension. Postural hypotension. Now first I have to explain the normal physiology, right, that how blood pressure changes and cardiac output changes with changing posture and what happens when patient is on nitrates. Most important side effect is postural hypotension. Now how this side effect occur? First let me explain the basics that let's suppose here is your heart and you know that from here there is venous side and this is the venous blood return to the right heart and you know it that from here it will go to the lungs and through the lungs it will come to the left heart. Is that right? Now, and here is your, let's suppose, just a minute, if we draw the aorta, on the aorta there are What is this? Carotid sinus. What is it? Carotid sinus. Now listen carefully. What really happens? First about the normal person and then about the Now in a normal person from lying down position, from the lying down position if normal person suddenly stand up, what happen in the body? When he suddenly stand up, the venous blood pulls into lower part of the body. This is point number one. Normal person from lying down position when suddenly stand up, venous blood pulls into lower part of the body. So venous return is reduced. So cardiac filling is reduced and of course end diastolic volume is reduced. So that will lead to reduced cardiac output. You understand? When a lying down position, person suddenly stand up, initially for a very brief time, there is reduction in venous return due to pulling into lower part of the body. There is reduced cardiac, uh, reduced venous return, reduced cardiac filling, reduced cardiac output, reduced stroke volume. This reduced stroke volume produces less blood pressure and there are baroreceptors in the carotid sinus. Immediately as soon as cardiac output is reduced through the baroreceptor information goes to the central nervous system. Right? Information goes to the central nervous system to the medulla. Right? And from the medulla vasomotor centers are stimulated. Which centers are stimulated? Vasomotor centers are stimulated and sympathetic outflow occurs. What occurs? Sympathetic outflow occurs. This sympathetic outflow, look here, the sympathetic fibers will lead to veno, they will lead to veno constriction, right? They will act on venous smooth muscle and release on the venous smooth muscle what thing? Norepinephrine. So what really happens? That sympathetic outflow has two functions. Number one, it will fire on the sympathetic outflow on the veins and squeeze the vein. So the normal person, as soon as he stand up and there is reduced cardiac output, it activate the compensatory mechanisms and reflex compensatory mechanism produces venoconstriction so that cardiac venous return should be maintained. So that cardiac output should be maintained and cardiac output should not drop significantly and for a prolonged time. Am I clear? In this way, if you, you are young healthy people from lying down position, when you stand up, you don't get any problem because reflex, ref, uh, neuronal reflexes squeeze the veins so that venous return should be maintained. Am I right? Now you imagine patient on nitrates. On the nitrates, what happens that from lying down position, if you suddenly, okay, this patient is going to run away. Now, from the lying down position, 
this patient is on the nitrates as soon as he stand up of course venous pooling will occur of course cardiac output will initially drop of course baroreceptors will be activated and these uh, baroreceptor you can say sensory nerves will stimulate and form the medulla that there is reduced cardiac output of course sympathetic nervous system will fire but if nitrates are working on these smooth muscles can sympathetic nervous system induce significant contraction no. answer is no so if sympathetic reflex mechanism cannot stimulate what contraction, contraction right it means venous return will not be maintained so there will be prolonged reduction in venous return and there will be prolonged reduction in cardiac output and in this person from lying down position when he will stand up he will develop significant fall in blood pressure systolic blood pressure is that right and we say with the posture from lying down posture to suddenly standing posture he has developed hypotension his blood pressure has dropped because compensatory mechanism could not maintain the blood pressure right because veins was dilated and they did not respond to uh, sympathetic overflow am i right so we say this patient will develop postural yes hypotension this type of hypotension is also called orthostatic hypotension so postural hypotension or orthostatic hypotension is a condition in which neurovascular mechanism cannot uh, you can say constrict the veins on standing and cannot maintain the venous return and they cannot maintain the cardiac output and severe and prolonged drop in cardiac output right on standing will lead to postural hypertension or orthostatic hypertension am i clear right now due to this thing the blood flow to the brain is increased or decreased decreased, decreased. this prolonged reduction in blood flow to the central nervous system will produce lightheadedness and that prolonged reduction in a perfusion to the central nervous system will produce vertigo that will produce dizziness or vertigo and with that if it become really too much then blood flow to the whole cerebral cortex becomes so low the cerebral cortex does not work and you know cerebral cortex is responsible to maintain your consciousness when cerebral cortex does not work you become transiently unconscious or syncopal attack occur so many patient when you give them anti hypertensive drugs those anti hypertensive drugs which interfere either with the output of sympathetic nervous system or interfere with the veno constriction such drugs have a risk of producing postural hypertension and such patient will come back to you doctor i had the hypertension hypertension did not do anything to me because most of the time mild to moderate hypertension is asymptomatic right but doctor you give me the drug and after taking your tablets when i wake up in the morning i develop severe dizziness headache and sometimes you know two days back i fell in the washroom because i got unconscious so you have to be careful when you are prescribing these drugs right that how how you can alleviate these side effects am i clear so one of the very important side effect is postural hypotension there is systolic drop significant systolic drop on standing up position with that number two position is there is lightheadedness and dizziness and sometimes even transient loss of consciousness due to global cerebral hypoperfusion am i clear right so this is something we have to take care about these patients that nitrates dose should be adjusted in such a way that patient should not undergo postural hypertension and another thing which is very important look when venous return is reduced attention plays any drug which significantly reduces the venous return you know that reduces cardiac output and of course venous return reduced and diastolic volume reduced cardiac output reduced and there is strong stimulation to vasomotor centers and there is strong sympathetic outflow please listen very carefully this is i told you already that this sympathetic outflow will fail to squeeze the vein but this sympathetic outflow will be able to stimulate heart 
And if there's SA node here, then this will stimulate the SA node. So this patient with hypotension will develop severe reflex tachycardia. And do you think this is good for a general patient? No. No. That is why we have to give the other friend of this drug. Who is the friend of nitrates? Beta blockers. So when we give beta blocker, they prevent the reflex tachycardia, which may be precipitated by nitrates. Again, let me repeat it. That when you are giving nitrates, right, there's significant venodilatation. In a way, it is good for us. And sometimes it is not good for us. Why it is good and therapeutically useful? Because venous pooling reduces venous return, reduces end diastolic volume, and that reduces the work of the heart and reduces the oxygen demand and angina is terminated. Terminated, is that right? But sometimes, if venous return is too much reduced and end diastolic volume is too much reduced, then cardiac output is too much reduced, that may lead to Severe sympathetic outflow, especially from when patients undergo postural change from lying down position to standing up. And when patients stand up, is that right? This sympathetic outflow will fail to constrict the vein, but it will be very successful in stimulating the SA node. SA node and AV node. And the sympathetic stimulation will also produce positive inotropic, sorry, positive coronotropic action and positive inotropic action. Of course, these two things increase the work of the heart. Right? So, we should give some other drug along with nitrate to prevent the side effect. So, we should block the beta receptors in the heart so that sympathetic nervous system does not drive the heart wild. Is that right? And the drug in combination should come as beta blockers. Is that clear? Right? So, these were some side effects with the nitrates. I've talked about that there's headache, there is Flushing, facial flushing, there can be hypotension, there can be reflex tachycardia which may precipitate. Patient will not come and say, doctor, I have reflex tachycardia. Patient will complain about palpitations. How, Jamie, how do you define the palpitations? What are palpitations or palpitations? Hello. Okay, he says this is something like, feeling like something coming out of chest. Yes, this is one of the expression for palpitation. Uh, but palpitation in medical term is different. You say palpitation is, in medical terms, palpitation is unpleasant awareness of cardiac activity. Either you think something is coming out of chest or you feel something is coming out of throat. But actually, what is palpitation? That patient becomes unpleasantly aware of cardiac heartbeat. Because, because, so many of these patients due to reflex tachycardia may complain about palpitations. Is that right? But remember, sometimes you are, you are pleasantly aware about the cardiac activity. Sometimes when you are with your certain circumstances, especially after exercise or some special company you are and you feel palpitation pleasantly, that is not to be treated medically. Is that right? So medically, we talk about palpitation as unpleasant awareness about the cardiac activity. Is that right? Unpleasant word is very important. We will be talking about beta blockers and their role in patient with angina, right? First of all, few words about the beta blockers. Beta blockers are the drugs which block reversibly or competitively, reversibly or competitively, competitively beta adrenergic receptors. You know, adrenergic receptors are classified like this. Receptors for epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dope, right? Receptors for catecholamine, they are classified like alpha receptors and beta receptors, right? We will not talk about alpha receptor today because beta blockers do not act on alpha adrenergic receptors. They mainly work on the beta adrenergic receptors. And beta adrenergic receptors are divided into two categories. That is beta 1 adrenergic receptors and beta 2 adrenergic receptor. Right? Beta 1 adrenergic receptors are present mainly on the heart. Beta 1 adrenergic receptors are present mainly on the heart. <coughs> Mm 
let me show you the beta 1 adrenergic receptor distribution on the heart. Here is your SA node, here is your yes, AV node, very good, bundle of A's and bundle branches. Now, beta 1 adrenergic receptors are present on SA node, they are present on atria, they are present on AV node, they are present on Purkinje fibers and specialized conduction pathway and they are present on ventricular myocardium. So it means that beta 1 adrenergic receptors are present on specialized myocardium as well as general myocardium. Specialized myocardium is S node, AV node and conduction pathway. And general myocardium is atrial myocardium and ventricular myocardium which does the function of contractility. So we can say beta 1 receptors are present throughout the heart. And here I would like to mention that now there is release of norepinephrine from the nerve endings and through the circulation, you know adrenal medulla releases epinephrine into circulation. So through the circulation, epinephrine reaches to all heart, epinephrine goes to all myocardium and through the nerves there is arrival of norepinephrine. Epinephrine and norepinephrine they work on this point number one, SA node. When they work on the SA node, this is star 1 action. I can write it that when they work on SA node, okay, I will write star 1 action. Star 1 action is the action on the SA node and that will produce positive chronotropic activity. Chronotropic effect. Positive chronotropic effect means increase in heart rate. This is the normal function of beta 1 receptor stimulation. Then when beta 1 receptors are stimulating the AV node, there is star 2 action. When beta 1 receptors are stimulating the AV node, then conduction through the AV node become fast and that produces positive dromotropic effect or action. That is increase conduction. That's on the AV node, right? Yeah, through the AV node, right? By action on the SA node, it produces positive chronotropic action. By action on the AV node, it produces positive dromotropic action. Remember, AV node is like a drum between the atria and ventricle. AV node is like a drum between the atria and ventricle. So, things which increase the activity of AV node conduction, they are positive dromotropic. And things or drugs which reduce the conduction through AV node, they are negative dromotropic. Then, Star 3 action is that epinephrine or norepinephrine stimulate the beta 1 receptor on contractile myocardium and that produces increased contractility called positive inotropic action. So star 3 action is positive inotropic action that is action of by stimulation of beta 1 receptors on the myocardial contractility when those receptors are stimulated there is increase when epinephrine stimulates the beta 1 receptors on myocardium, myocardial contractility is increased and we say that is positive inotropic action or effect. Am I clear? So this is the main action of beta 1 receptors on the heart. Moreover, beta 1 receptors have their receptors on, in the bronchial smooth muscle normally beta 1 beta 2 receptors now we are talking about beta 2 receptors beta 2 receptors act on the bronchial smooth muscle and normally produce bronchi bronco dilation bronchiolo dilation normally number 1 number 2 beta 2 receptors they work on the liver hepatocytes have beta 2 receptors and when this beta 2 receptors are stimulated on the hepatocytes there is increase glycogenolysis. It means when epinephrine is more in the blood, epinephrine will act on the hepatic beta 2 receptors and produces the breakdown of glycogen. And when there is breakdown of glycogen, there is increase glycogenolysis and that lead to the release of glucose from the liver. 
Thirdly, beta-2 receptors act on the pancreas and beta-2 receptor stimulation when it act on the pancreas releases glucagon. And this glucagon also act on the liver. And when glucagon act on the liver, okay, again let me repeat, that beta-2 receptor stimulation produces glucagon and this glucagon will act on the liver and increase gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis means production of glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. Is that right? So it means that beta-2 receptors can directly release the glucose from the liver. Beta-2 receptor activation on the liver can directly release the glucose by breakdown of glycogen plus beta 2 act activation can release glucagon so it can act on the liver and increase gluconeogenesis and further release the glucose into blood. Is that right? And beta 2 has many other functions also. Right now they are not relevant with us. Now we are going to discuss about the beta blockers. Beta blocker drugs are the drugs which will block the beta 1 receptors. And if they are non-selective drug, they will also block the beta 2 receptor. Now let's talk about those drugs into detail. I told you very briefly few actions of beta 1 and beta 2 receptors when these receptors are activated. Now we go to that these beta blocker drugs, they reversibly or competitively bind with the beta receptors and block them. And these beta blockers are non-selective drugs, non-selective beta blockers which will block the beta 1 as well as they will block the beta 2 receptors. They will block the beta 1 receptor as well as beta 2 receptors. The classical example of the drug in this category is propranolol. Propranolol and there are others also but the minimum you have to remember that the classical example of non-selective beta blocker is propranolol. But there are some other drugs, right, they are beta blockers and at low doses they specially block beta 1 receptor, uh, receptor, they work more on the beta 1 receptor. So they are called selective beta 1 blockers. And the classical drug in this category are selective beta 1 receptors blockers, these are atenolol, atenolol, acetabutolol. Right? The drugs which are present in this and atenolol, acetabutolol, and metoprolol. Metoprolol. Again, listen. One category is non selective beta blocker, which block beta 1 and beta 2 both. Then there is selective category, which block mainly beta 1 receptor at low doses. But remember, this selective action is lost at higher doses. For example, atenolol at lower doses will block mainly beta 1 receptor. Right, but as you keep on increasing the dose, beta 2 blocking will also start again. Beta 1 selectivity is only relative term because these drugs block more beta 1 and they block less beta 2, right? But they do block beta 2 to some extent. And if the dose is increased, then the selectivity is lost. And while blocking beta 1 at higher doses, they also block the beta 2. Am I clear? Once you have made this concept. You know beta 1 receptors are present on the heart. That is why beta 1 blockers are also called cardio selective beta blocker. Cardio selective because they especially work on the heart. Cardio selective beta blockers. So what are cardio selective beta blockers? These are the group of beta blockers which are beta 1 blocker at low doses. Am I clear? Now once we have talked a little bit about these drugs, beta blocker, let's see what is their role in angina. What are the advantages of beta blockers in angina, right? Let's suppose here is your heart. Okay, let's make a smaller heart. Okay, I need to clean it again. Right, so we have a heart over here. Again, what is here? SA node and what's here? 
AV node, right? And Purkinje system, right? And then now, I told you beta 1 and sephora are on SA node, right? They are on AV node as well as on atria and they are present on? Now, these are all beta 1 receptors. So, heart is well decorated with beta 1 receptor. Let's suppose we give a beta blocker drug. When we give a beta blocker drug, what this drug is doing? It will bind with the adrenergic receptors on SA node, on AV node, as well as on the atria and ventricle. So, it means that sympathetic action will be lost on heart. So, when SA node beta 1 receptors are blocked, then SA nodal stimulation by catecholamine is reduced, by endogenous catecholamine is reduced. So, heart rate will go up or down? Yeah. It will go down. So, actually it produces negative chronotropic action. This positive chronotropic effect of endogenous Endogenous, when SA node is blocked, that will lead to point number one is when SA node is blocked by the beta blocker, there will be negative chronotropic action and heart rate will reduce. And when you can say AV node is blocked, having its beta receptor blocked, then conduction through AV node will become slow and that, that will become negative dromotropic action. And when beta 1 receptors are blocked on contract, contractile ventricular myocardium, ventricular myocardium is no more driven by endogenous catecholamines and contractility of ventricles is reduced and that produces negative chronotropic action. In a nutshell, what can we say? That beta blockers reduce the electrical activity of the heart as well as reduce the mechanical activity of the heart. It's so simple to state that beta blockers reduce the beta 1 blockers especially, they reduce the electrical activity of the heart as well as mechanical activity of heart. When electrical activity in the heart is reduced, there is reduced normal automaticity and negative chronotropic action heart rate will reduce. Conductivity through the AV node is reduced and mechanical activity is reduced, it means contractility is reduced. Now listen, when beta blockers reduce heart rate as well as they reduce the contractility, it means they reduce the stroke volume. So if they are reducing the heart rate and stroke volume, it means they are reducing the cardiac output, it means they are reducing cardiac work. If heart rate is slow, you know donkey is moving less cycle. I think you, you should not forget the donkey. So the donkey is moving less cycles and this is contracting slowly. Is that right? And with less tension. So what really happens, the cardiac work is reduced and when cardiac work is reduced, there is reduced need of oxygen. This is how beta blockers help that primarily they lead to reduction in heart rate and reduction in heart rate due to negative chronotropic action and reduction in stroke volume due to negative inotropic action. And both things lead to reduced cardiac output, reduced work of the heart, reduced need of oxygen. Am I clear? Yes. No, oh, well, positive it, it, chronotropic increase the heart rate, negative chronotropic decrease the heart rate. Listen, catecholamine stimulate the beta 1 receptor and positive chronotropic action. Propranolol or retinolol block the beta 1 receptor and reduce the heart rate. Am I clear? No. Of course, we have to negative chronotropic will reduce the heart rate and reduce the conductivity and of course reduce the contractility. Let you, of course, you are right. I need to. Yeah, again, listen. First was physiology. That normally we have physiological, some sympathetic tone and some epinephrine in our blood. Right? This physiological epinephrine keeps S node somewhat stimulated, AV node somewhat stimulated, and contractility somewhat stimulated. Somewhat stimulated. Am I clear? Now, what is the advantage of beta blockers now? Beta blockers reduce the heart rate, reduce the contractility, eventually reduce the cardiac work and reduce the need for oxygen. So, beta blockers reduce the work of the heart, reduce the need of oxygen. So, do you think when your heart is well protected by beta blockers, its work is less, do you think uh, exertional angina will easily precipitate? No. Secondly, 
an extremely important thing. Not only at resting situation it is good. You know when this patient is resting, right, with the classical angina, this patient is resting and beta, he is on beta blocker. So, his heart rate is less than normal, maybe heart rate is 65, not 85, right. So, even resting heart rate is less. So, we can say resting work of the heart is reduced, less chance of angina during rest. And even if this person starts some, some exertion, person with beta blocker starts some exertion or he undergoes some emotional turmoil, right, beta blockers, when you are on the beta blockers and you undergo some emotional excitement or emotional tension, epinephrine is released. If your beta receptors are blocked, can epinephrine really drive your heart rate up? No. no? Or when you start exertion or physical activity, you know sympathetic tone goes up and your heart rate should go up. But do you think if you are on beta blockers, your heart rate go up? No. no. So the beauty of beta blocker is that not only it protects the heart when person is emotionally and physically comfortable, but it also protect against the cardio acceleration during emotional stresses and during physical exertion. Right? So these patients of angina, if they are protected with the beta blocker, if they are on the beta blocker, when they do physical exertion, heart rate will increase only slightly. The work of the heart will not be increasing too much. Right? That is why that total episodes of angina will be reduced. Is that right? So this patient with angina can have beta blocker and then he can afford to go under some excitements or emotional fluctuations because beta blockers will keep the heart well protected from the internal flooding of epinephrine. Is that right? So no risk of angina or less risk of angina or even MI. Am I clear? Yes. The point which I want to tell another that nitrates and beta blockers make a very good couple. Nitrates and beta blockers make a very wonderful couple. They help each other. You know, very good couple, very good man and a lady. What they are doing? You, I know you know what they are doing. But the good thing which they are doing is both of them are good for each other and they try to compensate for the shortcomings of each other. If husband has some, you can say shortcomings or adverse action, maybe wife will compensate if there is a good wife. And if wife has some adverse effect on community, on the family life, husband will try to compensate. Now we will see. When you combine the nitrates and beta blockers, they make a very wonderful couple, very happy and beautiful couple. They try to increase the advantages of each other and try to cancel the side effects of each other. Let's see how they do it. Now we discuss the combination of nitrates with beta blockers. You know that nitrates produce venodilatation. Should I make a diagram or without diagram we discuss? Without diagram. Okay. What really happens? Nitrates are strong. What? Venodilators. Right? Let's suppose here is your heart. I will make a very simple diagram. And here is your venous input to the heart. And here is your arterial system. Very simple diagram. Right? Here is your central nervous system. Right? This is the baroreceptor system from where? From arterial tree, from aortic body. They produce input to central nervous system. Is that right? And this is the sympathetic outflow. This is sympathetic outflow. Now sympathetic outflow is going to the heart. Right? Sympathetic outflow is going to the veins. And of course, sympathetic outflow is going to the arteries, right? So these are beta-1 receptor in the heart. This is the beta-1 receptor on the veins. Oh, veins, sorry, it has alpha-1 receptors. And arteries, these are alpha-1 receptors. Now you imagine. Listen please carefully. What is happening? When you give nitrates, venodilatation occurs. When there is significant venodilatation, venous return is reduced. Cardiac filling is reduced. Is that right? Cardiac output is reduced and cardiac work is reduced. All this thing is good for angina. But there is one problem with nitrate. 
when they work too much there is too much venodilatation cardiac out filling is too much reduced cardiac output may be dangerously reduced and when there is too much decrease in cardiac output nitrates by reducing the cardiac output right stimulate the reflex tachycardia they stimulate the reflex venoconstriction they stimulate the reflex arteriolar constriction but because nitrates keep the veins dilated so this reflex venoconstriction will not be there but there's a problem when nitrates dilate the veins too much sympathetic overflow will stimulate the heart and there may be reflex tachycardia so they in nitrates there's increased risk of heart rate increase and the risk of increase stroke volume because beta 1 receptors are also here is that right so it means nitrate giving nitrate is good in one way but in some patient by producing reflex sympathetic activity right there may be increased risk of heart rate and increased stroke volume and that may increase the work of the heart so in this way the work of heart which was reduced by reducing the preload has been cancelled if we give beta blocker listen carefully if we give beta blocker here then nitrate induced reflex sympathetic activity will not right will not be successful because beta blockers don't allow the sympathetic nervous system to work on the heart and secondly beta blocker do not allow uh, right in this way nitrate induced reflex tachycardia is reduced by beta blockers am i clear so in this way beta blocker help the patient to cancel some of the side effects of nitrate. nitrates am i clear now we come of course nitrate is good in return it should also help the action of beta blocker now let's come to the beta blocker and what it is doing i told you beta blocker slow the heart rate and slow the contractility and when beta blockers are slowing the heart rate and slowing the contractility and reducing the contractility it means uh, total venous filling time if your heart rate is less then diastolic time is more if your heart rate is less it means that total cardiac cycle the more or less per minute uh, less, less. less if cardiac cycle the less then naturally uh, diastolic time will increase mm -hmm. and it means that any drug which reduces the heart rate increases the diastolic filling time so it means beta blocker favor the ventricular filling so beta blockers increase and diastolic volume secondly another bad thing which beta blockers do is contractility is reduced and when contractility is reduced then less stroke volume is ejected and more is retained and again and diastolic volume will increase it means one of the disadvantage of beta blocker is that they increase the end diastolic volume do you think it is good for angina patient or bad it is bad for angina patient here the nitrates will help how by keeping the veins so much dilated that in spite of there is more di uh, diastolic duration still venous filling will be less is that right in this way again in a short in a nutshell advantage of beta blocker is that it reduces the heart rate reduces the contractility and reduces the work of the heart and by doing these things it is good for angina patient but unfortunately by the same thing it increases end diastolic volume which is bad for the patient of angina patient of angina but if you are giving with the beta blocker nitrates nitrate will take care of this unwanted action of the beta blocker that beta blocker should reduce the heart rate should reduce the contractility but there should not be increase end diastolic volume but beta blockers do increase and diastolic volume if given alone so if nitrates are given with them they will keep the veins enough dilated that in spite of prolonged diastolic filling and in spite of slow contractility still end diastolic volume is not increased. increased right so in this way both drugs help each other again because it's so important to understand this combination i will repeat it in now one sentence listen what is the advantages of combination of nitrates and beta blockers in a patient with angina classical angina listen side effect of the nitrates are partially compensated by the 
beta blockers, side effects of the beta blockers are partially compensated by nitrate. How? When we give nitrate alone, they may precipitate reflex tachycardia and, and that may lead to again increase in cardiac work. So whenever with the nitrate, beta blockers are there, nitrates will not be able to precipitate reflex tachycardia because beta receptor 1 receptors are blocked and in this way this unwanted action of nitrate is abolished. Then when beta blockers are given alone, if beta blockers are given alone, they do reduce the heart rate, they do reduce the contractility, in this way they do reduce initially cardiac work. But unfortunately, when heart rate is reduced too much and when contractility is reduced too much, then end diastolic volume increases. With low heart rate and with reduced contractility, end diastolic volume increases. Because at low heart rate, there is longer diastolic duration, so there is longer time to fill the ventricle. And if there is low contractility, then less amount of the blood is ejected and total pooling become more. So it means beta blockers are good and bad. How they are good? By protecting the heart against tachycardia and protecting the heart against contractility, they are good. By reducing the heart rate, by reducing the contractility, by reducing the work of the heart, by reducing the oxygen demand, they are good. But by increasing the endosolic volume, they are bad. But when nitrates are given along with beta blockers, then beta blocker tend to increase endosolic volume, but nitrate tend to reduced and diastolic volume. So this unwanted action of beta blocker is cancelled in the presence of nitrates. Is that right? That is why combination of nitrates and beta blocker make a wonderful combination. Okay. Is that clear? That's right. Now we come to one more thing. Some, some important side effects of beta blockers. Some extremely important side effects of beta blocker. Uh, every doctor should know what are the contraindications for the beta blocker. Before I really go for contraindication for beta blocker or special precautions in use of beta blocker, I tell you one thing very important. Have you even mentioned the side effects? Uh, side effects of beta blockers in detail I will discuss when I discuss the beta blockers with autonomic nervous system, right? But first thing which I want, I'm going to tell those side effects as well as contraindication together. Is that right? No, no. I will uh, give it more clearly now. Hold on. First, first listen, listen, please be attentive. What I was saying, I think you are getting tired. Maybe yeah, my, we, we are about to finish, but most important part of the lecture come now. Because if you give beta blocker to a wrong person, you may kill him, right? And you should not do that. That while trying to reduce, uh, you know, beta, uh, angina of a asthmatic patient, you give beta blocker and kill him with asthma. Yeah, so this, this mistake should not be done. So, let's talk about what are the special precautions with use of beta blocker in angina. The most important precaution is never stop the drug abruptly if you have been giving, giving it for a long time. When you are using beta blocker for a long time, never ever stop the beta blockers abruptly. Why? Can you tell me why? Why we should not stop the drug abruptly? The reason being, Beta 1 receptors has been blocked by the drug for a long time. And when receptors are blocked for very long time, when receptors are blocked for very long time, receptor undergo upregulation. For example, you are the patient with angina and you are using beta blocker from last three years. In these three years, you have been keeping the receptor blocked. So receptors will undergo down regulation or upregulation? Upregulation. Receptor concentration will decrease or increase on the heart. Increase. Look at the diagram. Whole the heart is overloaded and over decorated with the receptor. Whenever you block a receptor for a long time, receptor goes up regulation. Whenever you stimulate a receptor strongly for a long time, receptor go down regulation. Is that right? So patient on the beta blockers for a long time have up regulated beta receptors. Now, if patient has higher concentration of receptors, then you are keeping these receptors well blocked with beta blockers, no problem to the patient. But if you suddenly stop the drug, unfortunately, suddenly this heart with upregulated beta 1 receptor become exposed to the endogenous epinephrine and norepinephrine. And there will be very strong stimulation of endogenous catecholamine to this heart. 
suddenly heart rate will go up suddenly what is this cardiac stimulate uh, contractility will go up and that may enormously increase the heart rate and contractility and that may enormously increase the work of the heart and that may dangerously increase the oxygen demand and if your narrow vessel cannot meet that demand very dangerous what anginas or even full myocardial infarction may precipitate i hope you'll remember it in your lifetime right that if you are giving beta blockers for a long time then beta 1 receptors in the heart are upregulated and when beta 1 receptors are upregulated what really happens what really happens right that as soon as you abruptly stop the beta blockers by mistake right endogenous catecholamine will drive the heart wild suddenly heart rate will go up contractility will go up and cardiac work will go up oxygen demand will go up and if narrow vessels cannot meet that oxygen demand very severe ischemia may lead to even <coughs> precipitation of myocardial infarction is that right now we will we shall be discussing about the side effects and contraindications of beta blockers uh, this aspect of beta blockers is very heavily tested in all the medical exams the reason being that beta blockers are very important drugs they are very widely used drugs but they have to be used with a lot of precautions already we have discussed that if you are using beta blockers on the long term basis for your patient never stop them abruptly because that may precipitate ischemic heart disease episodes is that right so whenever you are going to stop beta blockers after a long term use you should taper off the dose over 7 to 14 days so over 1 to 2 weeks you should reduce the dose of beta blockers gradually then there are some side effects related with the use of beta blockers very important side effect is fatigue patient feels fatigue now this fatigue may be due to some central mechanism that central nervous system is slightly inhibited and this fatigue may be due to peripheral mechanisms as well you know that uh, beta 2 receptors are responsible for certain degree of vasodilatation in skeletal muscles did you know that or not right the blood vessels look here the blood vessels which are going to the muscles muscle right these blood vessels have less alpha 1 receptors and these blood vessels are having more beta 2 receptors you must be knowing that when epinephrine act on alpha 1 receptor it produces arteriolo but when epinephrine work on beta 2 receptors it produces vasodilation right so we can say in the peripheral circulation there is alpha 1 mediated vasoconstriction normally constriction in a normal person and in the peripheral circulation in normal person there is beta 2 mediated yes mediated vaso dilation naturally the blood vessels which are rich in alpha 1 receptors they undergo vasoconstriction on epinephrine right and blood vessels like blood vessels of the muscles which are rich in beta 2 you know receptors they undergo vasodilatation while keeping this in mind now you imagine if you put the patient on beta blockers right and if uh, beta blocker drugs are blocking the peripheral again if you are putting the patient on beta blockers and if beta blockers are blocking the beta 2 receptors of peripheral vasculature beta 2 receptors will not work because they are blocked by the drug what will happen beta 2 mediated vasodilatation will be lost right so the concept is when you give the beta blockers especially non-selective beta blockers when they block the peripheral vasculature beta 2 receptors then beta 2 receptor mediated vasodilatation is lost and blood vessels become slightly constricted in these patients if they do exercise do you think their vessels can dilate well how they will dilate oh, no, beta 2 mediated vasodilatation is lost no. you know during exercise when sympathetic flow is there is the right increased sympathetic outflow is there during exercise that lead to beta 2 mediated vasodilatation of the blood vessels especially to the 
muscles and if patient is already on beta blockers then if he do some exertion or patient is doing some exercise even though sympathetic outflow will be there but sympathetic outflow will not be able to stimulate the peripheral beta 2 receptor to mediate vasodilatation so there will be loss of beta 2 mediated vasodilatation in the patients who are on the beta blockers and of course if your blood vessels are not dilating during your exercise can you uh, have exercise for longer time you cannot and you will get fatigued too early and you will develop some degree of exercise intolerance you get it so this is one of the common problem that patient who are on the beta blockers uh, they develop a resting fatigue and especially they develop fatigue during physical exertion right too early right one of the mechanism may be that there is loss of beta 2 mediated vasodilatation right so there is no incremental increase in the blood flow to the muscles am I clear then another important thing is that uh, beta blockers which go to the central nervous system they produce sleep disturbances right they produce sleep disturbances many patients develop insomnia and some of the beta blockers which go to the central nervous system they also produce nightmares right sleep disturbance and night nightmares are another problem related with the use of beta blockers right then as you know adrenergic nervous system stimulates the, as you know adrenergic drive stimulates the central nervous system of course uh, beta blockers are anti adrenergic drugs so what happens they suppress the central nervous system very little but sometimes it may precipitate in some patients depression it may precipitate in some patients depression right and last but not, but not the least important side effect especially in the male this yes side effect, impotence. impotence you know males talk about immediately yes impotence right failure to maintain enough erection right that is also seen with the patient on the beta blockers so now we will come to the special contraindications and special precautions which must be used for the patient with beta, patients on the beta blockers, right? Now for this regard, uh, we will talk about, thank you, there are five situations which you should remember very well right I will explain them the five conditions at least where beta blockers should not be used or you should be very very clear careful right now what are those five conditions first I will tell you what are those five conditions and then I will tell you that why beta blockers are contraindicated in those five conditions you know this is a death star this is a death star and death even may occur uh, in some of these conditions and beta blockers are used it must be black star these five conditions number one is asthma asthma or other COPDs what are COPDs chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases right here the, the beta blockers should not be used I will explain why second condition is diabetes mellitus especially those diabetic patients who are insulin dependent who are insulin dependent beta blockers should are contraindicated or should not be used i will explain of course why then peripheral vasospastic diseases like renards phenomenon renards disease or renards phenomenon right the patient in which there is peripheral vasospastic situation beta blockers should not be used then patient with bradyarrhythmias right patient who are already having right bradyarrhythmias bradyarrhythmias right in these patients beta blockers should not be used and of course if someone has already depression will you use the beta blockers yeah he will get more depressed so these are the five conditions in which beta blockers should not be used very carefully I will deal these conditions one by one first of all why beta blockers are contraindicated in 
chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases right why first I will talk about normal what normally is going on in your lungs and what happens when you give the beta blockers listen carefully actually normally you know uh, smooth muscles of bronchioles bron bronchiolar smooth muscles they are very rich let's suppose this is bronchial system right and bronchial smooth muscles they are very rich in uh, beta 2 receptors this is bronchial smooth muscle I just showed you one bronchial smooth muscle and it is very very rich in beta 2 adrenergic receptors what are these beta 2 adrenergic receptors normally what happens <coughs> that your endogenous catecholamines and endogenous catecholamines stimulate beta 2 receptors on bronchial smooth muscle and normally you know there is beta 2 mediated yes bronchodilatation bronchodilatation so normally you have a slight degree of bronchodilatation maintained by the beta 2 activity right by the endogenous catecholamines now when you give a beta blockers to normal person there may be slight loss of this beta 2 mediated bronchodilatation and in a normal person it may not be a big problem but those patient who have coronary pulmonary uh, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases they have a tendency to develop they are already having a tendency to have obstruction to the airways is that right these patients may be asthma patients asthma patient COPD these patients may be yes chronic bronchitis patient chronic bronchitis patient these patients may be emphysema emphysema patients and of course the patient with bronchiectasis so these patients patient with asthma patient with chronic bronchitis patients with emphysema where there is loss of elasticity in the lung and bronchial cannot be kept open properly and patient with bronchiectasis in all these conditions there is always some degree of airway obstruction if these patient come to you and due to some hypertension or due to some uh, cardiac indication you inadvertently by mistake put these patient on the beta blocker especially non-selective beta blockers like propranolol there will be sudden loss of beta 2 mediated bronchodilatation and because they have already a degree of bronco obstruction so what happened this loss of beta 2 bronchodilatation may precipitate very severe bronchoconstriction and sometimes this may be fatal right so you have to be very careful that whenever you are going to administer to a patient beta blockers right and right you must be sure that patient does not have any disease like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease am i clear why because there is loss of beta 2 mediated bronchodilatation which is very important in the patient with coronary chronic obstructive lung diseases right this is one condition and here you have to remember that in these diseases even it is better to avoid the selective beta blockers because selective beta blocker like atenolol even though they are having more action to block the beta 1 and uh, they have less action on the beta 2 but still to some degree they do block the beta 2 receptors so why to take the risk am I clear then we come to the very important concept that why patient with severe diabetes or labile diabetes or the patient with insulin dependent diabetes why these patients should not be given beta blockers patient of diabetes mellitus especially who are insulin dependent let me tell you the main problem with the patient on the insulin dependent diabetic patient is that sometimes they develop severe hypoglycemic attack you know why 
For example, if I'm a severely diabetic patient and you are managing me by in injections of insulin, then I have a risk of developing hypoglycemia. What could be the reason? No, actually insulin is given in a standardized way. You will measure my requirements of insulin and give me. But what really happens, for example, patient has taken insulin injection but has not taken food. What are the conditions in which insulin dependent diabetics can develop? Hypoglycemia. Write it down. The conditions in which insulin dependent diabetics may develop severe hypoglycemia. Right? So, hypoglycemia may develop when patient had taken insulin but not food. He may develop or patient has taken insulin and after that he has taken food but he has vomited out. Vomiting. So you lost the food and insulin which has gone and will precipitate severe hypoglycemia. Or patient has taken insulin and even he has taken food but that day he has done specially more physical activity. Excessive? Excessive physical activity. And of course, if patient has inadvertently taken extra amount of insulin, he has taken insulin more than what he really needed, right? So under all these circumstances and many other circumstances, patient who are insulin dependent, they develop hypoglycemia. Now listen carefully. I'm going to explain that when insulin dependent patient develop hypoglycemia, when insulin dependent patient develop hypoglycemia, how the body responds. Is that right? Then I will explain how the beta blocker interfere with the body responses. Right? First I will tell you that if you, you are, if I am insulin dependent diabetic and I am undergoing hypoglycemia, how my bodily mechanisms are activated. Right? Later on I will tell you how beta blockers interfere with those bodily mechanisms. Listen. For example, this is my circulatory system. This is my circulatory system. What is happening? The primary problem is hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia means that glucose level is dangerously low. Is that right? Now, whenever glucose level is low, there are some physiological responses activated. Some neuronal responses are activated and some endocrine responses are activated. Number one. That whenever glucose level is low, what really happens that your central nervous system is activated. Low glucose will stimulate the central nervous system and that will lead to very strong sympathetic outflow. That will lead to very strong sympathetic outflow. Now this sympathetic outflow is good for the patient. The patient who is having, what is the patient problem? Hypoglycemia. As hypoglycemia gets more and more severe, there is stronger sympathetic outflow from central nervous system. Now what are the advantages of these sympathetic outflow? Number one, these sympathetic outflow will produce warning signs, warning symptoms, warning symptoms for the patient right for example that this patient may undergo tachycardia tachycardia and many patient right or this patient with tachycardia may develop tremors is that right so and even patient may develop sweating Now, listen, these warning symptoms are very important for the patient. Why they are important? The reason being that if I am insulin dependent diabetic and if my glucose level is going down, with experience I will learn that whenever I develop palpitations, tachycardia leading to palpitations and whenever I develop tremors and sweating, probably my glucose level is low and I should abort hypoglycemia by taking a lump of sugar immediately. Actually, all the patient whom you put on insulin, it's always wise that expose them purposefully 
to hypoglycemia and then educate them how they, these are the features. For example, if you are first time putting a patient on insulin, it's wise that tell him that you are going to expose him to the hypo and then really give a little more amount of insulin. And when he go hypo, then he will develop these warning signs and tell him how to recognize these warning signs and tell them that these warning signs are the signs are due to hypoglycemia. Then offer him some sugary drink or lump of sugar and educate him that how he will take it and how he, the symptoms of hypoglycemia will disappear. Is that right? So thank God the patient when they undergo severe hypoglycemia, nature provides the patient, nature provides the patient with warning symptoms. Is that right? Now, when you put the patient on beta blocker, listen carefully, when you put the patient on beta blocker drugs, right, there is beta 1 mediated tachycardia and there is beta 2 mediated tremors. So patient who is on beta blockers, will he be aware, he will develop the warning sign on hypoglycemia? No. So this is one problem that patients who are diabetic and insulin dependent and unfortunately you have put them on beta blockers. So whenever they develop hypoglycemia, right, they will not develop the warning signs of hypoglycemia. So patient will not be aware of that he is going into progressively deeper hypo glycemia. Beta so, 2 the yeah, beta 2 receptors when they are stimulated, you know, beta 2 receptors are present on the muscle spindles and when beta 2 receptors are stimulated, that leads to tremors. Is that right? So, beta 2 mediated tremors, beta 2 adrenergic receptor lead to tremors and of course, beta 1 adrenergic receptor lead to tachycardia. So, there is loss of tachycardia, there is loss of tremors. So, we can see that this drug leads to one problem which this drug is doing one dangerous thing that there is loss of warning symptoms of warning yes symptoms of hypoglycemia this is one problem so patient is handicapped that patient never gets aware that he is undergoing hypoglycemia and he does not take exogenous sugars am I clear now what is the next step Next step is that liver should provide the glucose. Liver should provide the extra <coughs> glucose. Let's suppose here is a hepatocyte. Here is a hepatocyte. Now what really happens that when your glucose level is going down, two humoral actions will occur. Two humoral actions will occur. Number one, of course, a uh, lot of adrenaline is released by adrenal gland due to sympathetic overflow. So there is a lot of epinephrine in the blood and normally this epinephrine act through beta 2 receptors. These are beta 2 receptors where on hepatocytes. So normally what happens when your blood glucose level is down due to increased sympathetic activity not only there are warning symptoms but increased sympathetic activity also increases epinephrine in the blood and this epinephrine will act on adrenergic receptors on hepatocytes and when this epinephrine will act on the hepatocytes what will happen that intracellular signaling eventually lead to breakdown of yes glycogen there is glycogen so glycogen will be broken down under these signals into glucose and this glucose will be pro provided to the blood from the hepatocytes. Is that right? What a beautiful normal mechanism that whenever you develop hypoglycemia, not only body is giving warning, given warning about that at the patient's conscious level, but endogenously increase epinephrine, stimulate the beta 2 adrenergic receptors on hepatocytes and they give intracellular signal which order the glycogen breakdown into glucose and liver start, hepatocytes start releasing glucose into blood to counteract the hypoglycemia. Is that right? It's good news or bad news? It's a good news. Unfortunately, when you give the beta blockers, they block the receptor here. So endogenous mechanism to compensate for hypoglycemia by glycogenolysis is lost. This is the action of propranolol. Propranolol block the beta 2 receptors on the hepatocytes. 
and then epinephrine induced glycogenolysis is lost so glycogenolysis cannot be done and hepatic glucose cannot be released to compensate for the decreasing glucose level in the blood am i clear so now it's a good news or bad news it's, bad it's news. a bad news is it right now not only this another help normally come and that help come from pancreas you know what pancreas produces under severe hypoglycemia pancreas produces glucagon it produces glucagon and this glucagon also has receptors right on what hepatocytes glucagon has also receptors on the hepatocytes and when glucagon activate the hepatocytes and give signals to the hepatocytes these master metabolic cells what they will do they will start converting the fatty acids and amino acids into glucose right what will be the result that conversion of fatty acids and amino acid to what thing to glucose right and this process is called gluconeogenesis let's define what is gluconeogenesis gluconeogenesis is the metabolic process in which we make glucose from non carbohydrate sources right and in the liver the process of gluconeogenesis is activated by glucagon right so it means that there are two mechanisms right that one mechanism is look from the liver we can get glucose by two mechanism number one we can get glucose by breakdown of glycogen number two we can get glucose by breaking the fatty acids and amino acids and using their carbon skeletal skeletons using the fatty acids and amino acids carbon skeletons to build new glucose is that right the first process breakdown of glycogen is called glycogenolysis and the second process is called gluconeogenesis now look at it here is again beta blockers make a trouble actually beta receptors are present beta 2 beta receptors are present on glucagon releasing cells you know this is a glucagon releasing cell and what really happens that during hypoglycemia glucagon releasing cells release glu glucagon which will do gluconeogenesis unfortunately beta blockers also block these receptors so it means beta blockers reduce the release of glucagon beta blockers reduce the release of glucagon and when glucagon release is impaired then liver is unable to do gluconeogenesis now let's sum up what's happening look here attention that when a patient is on beta blockers and patient is diabetic patient and insulin dependent this patient may undergo extremely severe hypoglycemia right and why this patient undergo very severe hypoglycemia one reason is that when such patient is on beta blockers right whenever hypoglycemia occur patient does not develop warning symptoms so patient is never knowing that how or the, that patient is suffering with hypoglycemia and patient does not take external glucose is that right this is problem number 1 problem number 2 beta blockers also impair the internal hepatic glucose release in hypoglycemia how do they impair in a normal person epinephrine stimulates the hepatocytes to produce glucose from glycogenolysis and normally epinephrine also stimulates the glucagon producing cells so that glucagon should act on the hepatocyte and produce new glucose from gluconeogenesis these are the two main hepatic uh, mechanisms which provide the glucose to the blood whenever there is hypoglycemia unfortunately patient who is on the beta blockers uh, hepatic beta 2 receptors are blocked so epinephrine induced glycogenolysis cannot be induced so this source of hepatic glucose supply is lost secondly when patient is on beta 2 blockers right then glucagon release is also impaired 
so glucagon glucagon mediated gluconeogenesis cannot be done and further a loss of internal supply of compensatory glucose from the liver so patient is not taking the glucose from outside and hepatic gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis is impaired and internal glucose is also not released from the liver so patient goes into very severe hypoglycemia and patient may develop even is very severe irritation and patient may develop fats or even may go into coma right so of course you don't want this for your patient if you don't want for this patient so next time you have to be careful for what that when a patient has insulin dependent diabetes mellitus don't put them on beta blockers look for alternative drugs am i clear okay now we come to the third thing here also it's wise not to use beta blockers patients who have peripheral patients who have peripheral vasospastic tendency what is renards disease or renards phenomenon actually in renards phenomenon peripheral vessels of the limbs especially vessels of the uh, hands they undergo severe vasospasticity sometimes again what happens in renards disease or renards phenomenon that patient has a tendency to develop severe vasospasticity of the peripheral vessels is that clear and that may make you know a hands cold and pale and you know the first they will become very pale and cold and then later on they may undergo reactive cyanotic and then reactive hyperemia right this, these whenever this vasospasticity is city is pre, uh, precipitated that will lead to cold extremities and painful extremities and if patient who has such tendency if unfortunately you put such patient on beta blockers due to some indication what will happen the beta 2 mediated peripheral vascular vasodilatation is lost what really happens that if such patient is put on the beta blockers then endogenous epinephrine cannot dilate keep a small degree of dilatation in the peripheral vessels and patient has already a tendency for vasospasticity so beta 2 mediated loss of vasos uh, vasodilatation will lead to intense vasospasticity and severe problem in the patient with peripheral vascular disease am i clear then we come to the patient with bradyarrhythmia this is the most easy to explain of course if there is a patient even if he is having angina or mi or congestive cardiac failure but along with these problems he has bradyarrhythmias bradyarrhythmia, bradyarrhythmia means that any patient who is having let's suppose one example of bradyarrhythmia is sinus bradycardia right if someone has his sa node too much suppressed if sa node is working very less we say there is sinus bradycardia if heart rate is less than 60 per minute in the day time or heart rate is less than 60 per minute 50 per minute in the sleeping in the waking state if your heart rate is less than 60 per minute this is sinus bradycardia or during the sleep if heart rate is less than 50 per minute that is also sinus bradycardia or due to some reason av node is not working well maybe av node is patient is on some drug or there is some pathology with the av node and there is some degree of heart block heart block mean that impulses from the atrium are not transmitted to the ventricles in a normal fashion there is undue delay for the atrial impulses to go to the ventricle or maybe if atrial impulses are all together not able to go to the ventricle such conditions are called heart blocks right now in such patients uh, epinephrine through the beta 2 receptors is normally responsible to stimulate sa node and av node is that right epinephrine normally stimulate sa node and av node is that right normally epinephrine epinephrine even norepinephrine due to norepinephrine comes from sympathetic nerve endings write it down norepinephrine is mainly released from sympathetic nerve endings and epinephrine is mainly released from adrenal medulla so epinephrine and norepinephrine through activation of beta 1 receptors on sa node and av node they act as stimulatory agents is that right now if a patient has already bradyarrhythmia either patient is having sinus bradycardia or nodal blocks 
and at the top you supply the patient with beta blockers you block these receptors so in a patient who has already bradyarrhythmia if you abolish the catecholamine mediated stimulation to s node and av node simple mild to moderate bradyarrhythmia will immediately convert into very severe degree of bradyarrhythmia is that right and due to that reason if you have a patient with a tendency of bradyarrhythmias please don't try beta blockers there am i clear for example if there's partial block in the av node and some of the impulses from atr are going down to ventricle and some impulses are not going but once you give the beta blocker maybe none of the impulses from atr go to the ventricle is it clear yes sir. right another important thing with bradyarrhythmia uh, in acute in acute congestive cardiac failure now this is a very important point to understand you have to be really very sharp to understand this point because these days uh, we use beta blockers as a treatment in patient with congestive cardiac failure but if someone has very acute congestive cardiac failure then we should not give the beta blockers because that may worsen the symptom you know beta blockers are negative inotropic agents right they reduce the contractility do you know that or not right and if patient has already mechanical impairment of the heart and very severe mechanical impairment right would you like to give the patient some negative inotropic agent answer is no but here you have to remember these days beta blockers have become one of the standard drug used in patient with congestive cardiac failure why they are used in congestive cardiac failure i will explain in lecture on congestive cardiac failure management but the point which you have to remember that if a patient is severely under very severe mechanical failure of the heart right of course beta blocker should not be done this is the right because beta blocker in heart failure have a long term benefit but if a patient is in such a severe failure uh, and you give the beta blocker maybe patient does not live for long term benefit patient dies with complete failure am i clear so use of beta blockers in cardiac failure has to be very very judicious is that clear and now in the end i told you beta blocker should not be given in patient with depression i think there's no fun in explaining that i told you one of the important side effect of beta blocker is mental depression of course patient if, if patient is already having mental depression and at the top right you give him beta blocker for hypertension or as anti arrhythmic drugs or as anti angina drug he will go into very deep depression and maybe this person commits suicide that's a very bad news isn't it so i hope my very good students will remember that beta blockers should be used in these conditions better not to be used or to be used with lot of care or best is that that you should consult your seniors if you have to use them am i clear how the mechanism of depression and depression it's so simple let me tell you when your adrenergic activity is more you are excited or you are depressed excited, excited. so it means person who is depressed already he has reduced adrenergic activity is in his brain when you will study the pathology of depression one of the reason of depression is the monoamines in central nervous system are reduced the action of epinephrine norepinephrine dop and uh, dopamine and serotonin especially these are reduced in depression already patient has reduced adrenergic activity in the brain and due to that reason he has depression at the top you give some beta blocker and block the remaining activity of uh, sympathetic nervous system what do you think patient will be excited he will go into deeper depression some of them become so depressed even they don't have energy to commit suicide why i am telling you this because those patient who are extremely depressed and they don't have energy to commit suicide when you give them anti depressant drug this sometimes a little little get better and get energy to commit suicide so you have to be careful when you patient manage the patients of depression right let's have a break now today we are going to talk about the calcium channel blockers and their role in patients with angina right so our major discussion is calcium channel blockers and their role in yes please role in angina first of all i will tell you that what uh, what calcium channel blockers are going to do 
For example, if you give a patient calcium channel blockers, calcium channel blockers are a group of the drugs which will bind with the calcium channels. Which calcium channel? Voltage gated calcium channel. You must know there are many types of calcium channels, right? And our drugs use a selected special group of calcium channels. And which calcium channels? Voltage gated calcium channels. And which type of voltage gated? L type. So what we say? that they are competitive blocker of L type calcium channel block. <laughs> you may be thinking that why I'm stressing that they are blocking a specific type of calcium channel. Why it is so important to know it? The reason being that calcium influx in the cell operates many biological functions. Right? For example, calcium influx in the neurons releases neurotransmitter. Calcium influx in the endocrine cells releases the hormones. Calcium influx in smooth muscles and skeletal muscles that can lead to contractility. In the same way, calcium influx in the myocardial cells also produces contractility. Now, when we want a particular drug which should be useful in the patient with cardiovascular diseases, we want that drug should block the calcium channels only in the myocardium and smooth muscles. So that vascular diameter should be altered and myocardial activity should be altered. But we do not want any drug which will also block the calcium channels which are involved in neurotransmitter release. And we do not want any type of calcium channel blocker which will block the endocrine cells calcium influx so that endocrine release should be disturbed. So what I was saying that there are many types of calcium channel blockers. Some are controlling the neurotransmitter release, others are controlling exocytosis of the endocrine cells. Now these two types of channels should not be blocked. If we have a drug which can block all the calcium channels that will go into trash basket. Right? So what I wanted to put that when we are using calcium channel blocker in cardiovascular diseases we need such drugs which will specifically block the calcium channels which are present in the myocardial cells and the smooth cells of the blood vessels. Is that right? Now, the calcium channels, which are calcium channel blocker which are presently available to us, they are basically, I will mention three classical drugs. Three classical drugs, even though there are now many new drugs, but all of them are compared and contrasted with these three classical calcium channel blockers. One calcium channel blocker is called nifedipine. Nifedipine, very commonly used. And you should be able to compare and contrast the actions of nifedipine with the actions of deltaiazem. Deltaiazem. And third important classical drug in calcium channel blocker is Vrapamil. Now just knowing the name of these drugs here is not enough. You must know how they are different from each other. Because even though all of them work on the cardiovascular system, but the way they work is significantly different. Now what is the difference? Let's talk about. This is your heart. Right? Let's suppose here is your heart. And this is atrial myocardium. And here is ventricular myocardium, right? First I will tell you in the heart which tissue is dependent on calcium, right? Then we'll talk about how the drugs block it. Basically, as a node, depolarization is calcium dependent. Point number one is that as a node, depolarization is calcium dependent. Number two, AV nodal depolarization is also AV nodal depolarization is also calcium dependent. Now let me stress first. Depolarization in S node is calcium dependent. Depolarization in atrial muscle is sodium dependent. This is a very big difference. You must write it down. That in the myocardial tissue, in the whole myocardium, right, some of the myocardial tissue is having depolarization which is calcium dependent and some of the myocardial tissue has depolarization which is sodium dependent and let's make it like this. 
depolarization myocardial depolarization myo cardial depolarization right which can divide it into calcium dependent depolarization and sodium in flux dependent depolarization now which are the calcium dependent AC node and AV node. AC node and AV node are calcium dependent depolarization and sodium dependent depolarization are atrial myocardium, atrial general myocardium and ventricular general myocardium. Remember AC node and AV node are also myocardial tissue but it is specialized myocardial tissue. AC node and AV node are modified myocardial tissue. SA node has lost, it is specialized, it has lost the capacity, the myocardial cell in SA node has lost the capacity for contractility, but acquired the capacity of automaticity. Automaticity means increased tendency to produce automatic depolarization. In the same way, AV node is also specialized myocardium, it's not general myocardium, specialized myocardium, modified myocardium. What is special thing about AV node? The myocardial cells which are present in AV node have again lost the capacity to contract and they have acquired the capacity to for slow conduction my friend no? so that current from atrium will be passing through AV node so slowly that atria should complete their contraction fill the ventricle only then current will come to the ventricle and ventricles will contract is that right so what I wanted to say that the myocardium and the heart has two types of myocardium. There is general myocardium and there is specialized myocardium. General myocardium is general atrial contractile myocardium, general ventricular myo contractile myocardium, right? But specialized myocardium is AC node and AV node plus Purkinje system. You know Purkinje system that is also specialized modified myocardial fibers. The bundle branches and Purkinje fibers. But remember that this Purkinje fibers their depolarization is sodium dependent, right? So now today onwards you have to remember that specialized myocardium is AC node, AV node and Purkinje system. General myocardium is atrial contraction and ventricular contraction. Is that right? Calcium dependent electrical activity is seen in AC node and AV node. AC node and AV node depolarization is calcium dependent. And sodium dependent depolarization is atrial and ventricular myocardium plus one specialized tissue which is also sodium dependent not calcium dependent. Now you may be thinking why I am stressing it. The reason being that, that there are some drugs which act as calcium channel blocker. So they will reduce electrical activity in this tissue. And the other drugs which are sodium channel blocker, they will mainly act the electrical activity of atria, ventricular and Purkinje system. Is that clear? Am I right? This is one thing, right? That there is calcium dependent automaticity here, this calcium dependent conductivity here because this is a function of automaticity, this is a function of conductivity, slow conduction. But one more thing, even though, listen carefully, even though the atrial and ventricular myocardium has depolarization which is due to sodium, but contraction of atria and ventricle depends on sodium. calcium. Oh, oh. Again listen carefully, atrial and ventricular depolarization is sodium dependent. But contractility of atria and ventricular is calcium dependent. Is that right? Now, in a nutshell, we can say calcium dependent activities in the heart. So that then we'll know that when calcium channel blockers are given, what really happens? Physiology linked with pharmacology. Now we can say what are the calcium dependent cardiac activities? Cardiac activities, calcium dependent. Is that right? Which can be modified by calcium channel blockers. One thing we already know. Yes, SA node plus AV node depolarization. Second thing should be clear. Atrial plus ventricular, not depolarization but contraction. But contraction. It means when we will give calcium channel blockers will reduce the activity of AC node, electrical activity of AC node will reduce the electrical activity of AV node. Plus will reduce the calcium channel blocker will reduce the mechanical activity of atria and ventricle. 
you know heart has basically electrical activity and vent and mechanical activity is that right so we can say now we go that if you give a calcium channel blocker what will happen to heart if there's a calcium channel blocker which can block the calcium channels in the heart what really happens again what will happen to SA node it cannot depolarize it's very easy to understand if SA node is exposed to the calcium channel blocker it cannot go under depolarization easily the rate of depolarization will be slow right it means tendency of SA node to produce automatic impulses is slow so there we say that there is reduced automaticity calcium channel blocker when they act on SA node they reduce the automaticity and reduced automaticity is technically called we say that there is negative yes chronotropic action chronotropy so calcium channel blocker when they act on SA node they, they slow down the rate of depolarization of SA node they inhibit the automaticity of SA node total number of cardiac impulses generated per minute by SA node has been reduced of course that will lead to reduced heart rate that will lead to yes reduced heart rate and this phenomenon is called negative chronotropic action right so one action of the calcium channel blocker is negative chronotropy secondly when calcium channel blockers will work on what is this AV node what will happen here it was SA nodal activity now AV node it's very easy when SA node is under the calcium channel blocker and you know AV node is calcium dependent depolarization so again electrical activity in SA node is suppressed major function of SA node was uh, AV node was that it was transferring the impulses from atria to ventricle when AV node is suppressed then transfer of impulses from atria to the ventricle is further reduced or suppressed is that right so we can say that there is pathological depression of conductivity there is pathological dependent of uh, depression of conductivity through the AV node is that right and that is called negative yes please dromotropy is that right and that will lead to if this action become excessive that will lead to what problem if this action become excessive yeah bradycardia nodal bradycardia simply we call it heart blocks what are heart blocks heart blocks are conditions in which impulses from the atria right impulses from the atria are going to the ventricle either with undue delay or they are not going at all what is heart block the term is also called heart block the same thing is also called there is another term for this we call it nodal block there can be heart block there can be nodal block and some people call it junctional block all these are the same thing heart block or nodal block or junctional block these terms are used that whenever normally what happen attention please every atrial impulse will conduct from atrium to the ventricle with normal delay, delay of 0.1 second it means when atrial impulse reaches EV node it is held there for how much time 0.1 second so that atria complete their contraction and fill the ventricles only then current is released but let's suppose you have given some calcium channel blocker now rather than 0.1 second maybe this delay is taking 0.2 second so it is normal due delay or undue delay it is undue delay and if every impulse listen now carefully if every impulse from atrium is going to the ventricle but with undue delay we say first degree heart block what is that first degree heart block when every impulse from atrium eventually goes to the ventricle but with undue delay and in second degree heart block probably AV node is further suppressed probably AV node is further suppressed then second degree heart block occur what is second degree heart block some of the impulses from atrium go down and some are aborted they are not allowed to go down is that right in first degree heart block every impulse from here was going down but with undue delay in second degree heart block some of the impulses will be allowed to go down and others not for example SA node is firing at the rate of 80 but 
AV node allow only 40 impulses down. So atrial activity will be 80 per minute and ventricular activity will be 40 per minute. So we call it second degree heart block. And if really there is much toxicity due to calcium channel blocker, then there will be very big problem. That if there is too much toxicity of calcium channel blockers and they suppress the AV node so much that AV node cannot conduct any atrial impulse to the ventricle, we say there is complete heart block. What is that? Complete heart block or we simply called it third degree heart block. So this is partial heart block. This is also first degree and second degree both are partial heart block because and in this case none of the atrial impulses is able to pass through the AV node to ventricle we call it complete heart block. Is that clear? Now why I am explaining it because we have to relate the physiology with the pharmacology and, and normal actions of calcium channel blocker and toxic actions of calcium channel blocker. So this is one thing can happen and here I should also mention as I have told you that AV node is normally suppressed by calcium channel blocker and if it is too much suppressed it will produce heart blocks. But if S node is suppressed, first S node will reduce its automaticity. For example your heart rate is 90 per minute, I give you calcium channel blocker which specially work on S node, your heart rate may become 60 per minute, 50 per minute and if there is too much, right we say that when heart rate is suppressed less than 60 per minute, we say the problem is sinus, what is that? Bradycardia. So it is one of the side effect of calcium channel blockers, sinus bradycardia. And when we say there is sinus bradycardia, when heart rate is less than 60 due to reduced automaticity of S node. When heart rate is less than 60 due to reduced automaticity of S node. And if you are really giving very heavy dose of calcium channel blocker, very toxic dose and SA node stop working. What term we use it? There is, what term is used? We say there is sinus, there is sinus arrest. It is completely arrested, no function of SA node. If there is very heavy dose of calcium channel blocker, right? For example, very heavy dose of calcium channel blocker here will produce sinus arrest. No automaticity displayed by SA node and very heavy dose here will produce complete heart block. Is that right? So we'll say that there is sinus arrest. Sinus arrest is SA and sinus arrest is with AV. Look, look, just a minute. When you give calcium channel blocker, S node and AV node electrical activity reduce. As the some reduced electrical activities are said to be bradyarrhythmias. What are they called? Brady arrhythmia, heart has gone out of rhythm on the bradycardia side, slow side. Brady arrhythmias may be related to S node or they may be related to AV node or to the both. When Brady arrhythmias are here, these are called sinus Brady arrhythmias. When they are here, we call it nodal Brady arrhythmias. Sinus Brady arrhythmias are simple sinus bradycardias or if sinus activity totally stop, we say that there is sinus arrest. Nodal Brady arrhythmias are first degree heart block, second degree heart block and third degree heart block. Is that clear? Right. Now, this was the action of calcium channel blockers on S node and AV node, right? Which are calcium dependent depolarizing tissues. Now we come to the action of the calcium channel blockers on contractile myocardium, especially ventricular myocardium. What happens in the ventricle? Normally, you know, in the plateau phase, some calcium goes in when there's depolarization of the ventricle, during plateau phase, there is calcium going in. That calcium triggers the release of calcium from sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that total calcium act on troponin and pull the tropomyosin away so that actin myosin can contract. So we can say that calcium in flux during the plateau phase of action potential triggers the release of intracellular stores of calcium within the myocardial cell, a lot of calcium which is present in the myocardial cell that is, that is going to lead to contractility. Is that right? Now listen. If you give calcium channel blockers, right, then uh, calcium channels which are throwing the calcium during the plateau phase, they are blocked with the drug. So it means trigger calcium to the myocardium is increased or decreased? Decreased. decreased. Then intracellular release of calcium is also decreased. Then of course contractility is? Decrease. decrease and the term which will be used 
is, yes please, the term which is used, again listen, on calcium channel the block on these cells, calcium is not going in and ultimately there is suppression of calcium dependent contractility. There is reduced calcium dependent contractility. When contractility is reduced, the term which is used is, yes, Jamie, what is the term? A bus. When calcium. Yeah, negative inotropic effect. Negative inotropy. Actually, negative inotropy means there is, yes, there is reduced strength. Strength of contraction. Is that right? Negative inotropy means that there is reduced contraction, reduced strength of contraction. But while not only strength of contraction is reduced, even velocity of contraction is also reduced by blocking the calcium channel channels. For example, let me explain that let's suppose this is a graph showing the contractility. Is that right? Normal contractility is that during the systole, pressure will go up, contraction tension will go up and then tension will come down and then there is diastole. Is that right? This is the normal dynamics of systolic contraction. Is that right? Now, this is the total what? Strength of contraction. This, this is the strength of contraction and here is the time frame. On y axis you have time, on x axis you have strength of contraction. Is that right? This is normal. Now let me draw the graph when calcium channel blocker is given. When calcium channel blocker is given, number one, there is reduced total contraction. This process, the total contraction has been reduced. This is called negative inotropy. Total contraction has been reduced and relaxation is also reduced. Now look at the phenomenon. Normally, this is a high velocity with which it will go to the peak contraction and with high velocity it will relax. But after calcium channel blocker, the velocity with which, with which the tension will develop and tension will be lost. That velocity has been reduced as well as strength has been reduced. For example, normally to go to the peak tension, this was the time taken. But after the calcium channel blockers, the time taken for peak tension is prolonged. Now, so we can see when calcium channels block the myocardial cal uh, calcium, uh, calcium channel blockers block the calcium channels in the contractile myocardium, there is reduced contraction as well as there is reduced velocity, right? Because when you reduce the contraction, oxygen demand of the heart is reduced. And when you reduce the contractility velocity, that also further reduces the oxygen demands. So what is the term used when velocity of contraction is reduced? You have already told me the term when there is reduced strength of contraction. When reduced strength of contraction we say there is negative inotropy. When there is reduced velocity of contraction, what is the term used? When there is, yes, reduced velocity of contraction. T of contraction and relaxation. It slowly contracts and slowly relaxes because this thing will reduce the oxygen demand. When you reduce the strength of contraction, oxygen demand is reduced. When you reduce the velocity of contraction, oxygen demand is further reduced. What is the term used? Okay, $10 price for this. No one needs $10, all of you are very rich. What is the story? Oh, now he asked, what is the question? No, what is the story? It's a letter. No, I'm just telling you that don't concentrate on $10, concentrate on the topic. What I'm saying, yeah, uh, I'm, cons I'm just telling that by giving the calcium channel blocker, and please add it, even by giving the beta blockers, both have the same action. They reduce the total strength of contraction, they also reduce the velocity of contractile mechanism. Both of them, calcium channel blockers and beta blocker. St reduction in strength of contraction is called? I negative inotropy. Reduction in velocity of contraction is called, yes, $10 question. I think $10 is fine to you. Negative dromotropy is reduced conduction. Remember, reduced normal automaticity is negative chronotropy. Reduced normal conduction is negative 
ड्रोमोट्रोपी रिड्यूस्ड स्ट्रेंथ ऑफ कॉन्ट्रेक्शन इज कॉल्ड नेगेटिव आइनोट्रोपी एंड रिड्यूस्ड वेलोसिटी ऑफ कॉन्ट्रेक्शन इज कॉल्ड या शान इज गोइंग टू टेल व्हाट इज दैट नेगेटिव क्लाइनोट्रोपी क्लाइनोट्रोपी एक्सेलेंट सो समवन विल गेट 10 डॉलर्स लेटर राइट रिड्यूस्ड क्लाइनोट्रोपी सो टुडे व्हेन यू talk to your friends you can say calcium channel blocker reduce the heart rate reduce the conduction through ab node reduce the contractility reduce the work of the heart and reduce oxygen demand so they are good in angina but when you talk to a cardiologist then you should talk in a better terms that calcium channel blockers are negative chronotropic drugs they are negative dromotropic drugs they are negative inotropic drugs as well as they are negative clinotropic drugs right and then you mention because heart rate is reduced and contraction dynamics are reduced so what happens total oxygen work of the heart is reduced per minute work is reduced and oxygen demand is reduced and when oxygen demand is reduced uh, you remember in the beginning of the lecture i told you in stable angina what was the problem there was atherosclerotic plaque which was giving small amount of blood flow to myocardium right so whenever you develop tachycardia or whenever you develop extra work of the heart whenever you develop the extra work of the heart what really happens that atherosclerotic obstruction cannot be dilated that is fibrous tissue and plaque right so whenever your heart oxygen demand is more let's suppose this is myocardium piece and this was your coronary supply and let's suppose this coronary supply here is obstructed more than suppose 80% obstructed or 70% obstructed now the little blood which is coming due during the which little blood which is coming through the obstruction that may be enough for the resting myocardium but whenever myocardium undergoes increased work during tachycardia or when patient is exerting right this point cannot dilate so the dependent myocardium will become ischemic and that will precipitate classical angina 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 of exertion or angina with excitement or emotional tension you are understanding you remember that what was the trick to manage this angina one of the trick was that reduce reduce the work of the heart so much and reduce the demand of oxygen of the heart so much that reduced demand of oxygen is now matching with the reduced supply of oxygen do you get it and this function can be achieved with calcium channel blockers because calcium channel blocker re reduce the heart rate reduce the contractility of course when heart rate is reduced when there is reduced heart rate and there is reduced contractility and when there is reduced contractility it means reduced stroke volume so that will lead to reduced cardiac output and of course reduced cardiac work that will lead to reduced cardiac oxygen demand is that right so by reducing the heart rate and reducing the contractility and stroke volume we reduce the cardiac work and reduce the oxygen demand and in a typical angina what we really wanted we wanted to reduce the demand of oxygen so much that reduced demand of oxygen by the myocardium is matching now with the reduced supply of oxygen and patient does not feel ischemic pain am i clear this is how uh calcium channel blockers work on the heart and help in termination of symptoms of angina but there's still more to be said the very special thing which i would love to mention is that nifedipine okay that i will mention later when i go into detail of their differences what's your question but is, is this calcium channel blocker is best drug used for the classical angina or any angina uh, i will explain this i've just mentioned calcium channel blockers can be used in classical angina right now i've just told that but in classical angina first you should try nitrates and beta blockers if both of them are not effective then you add the calcium channel blockers is that right am i clear but i will explain some further functions of calcium channel blocker then we'll integrate the information that how it is beneficial some other types of angina as well right now we have just concentrated only the action of calcium channel blockers on the myocardium that is electrical how the calcium channel blockers alter the electrical activity of heart and how calcium channel blockers alter the mechanical activity of the heart mechanical and electrical activity of heart now we'll make a diagram and you must remember this in a good way okay
okay here is again our heart back already you know how much we have discussed about it remember when i will draw diagram you see i'm very careful that atrial myocardium should not touch the ventricular myocardium why because between the atrial myocardium and ventricular myocardium there's fibrous partition ring the only connection between the atrial myocardium and ventricular myocardium is normally AV node. This is the only electrical window between the atria and the ventricle in a normal subject. Right. This is what we have seen. That where, what are the... Now, you see, here is... What was this? Arterial side. And what was thing on this side? Venous side right and you must be knowing already that what are here these are the capillary beds in different tissues right and you know blood is coming through arterioles to the tissues and leaving through veins now now you will see the integrated function of calcium channel blockers where cardiac function and vascular functions are correlated. We have only discussed about that it produces, acts here, reduces heart rate, acts here and reduces, yes, reduces conductivity, right, and acts here and reduces contractility and stroke volume. This is what we have already discussed in a nutshell with all the mechanisms. But we have to remember one more thing. That calcium channel blockers also act on the smooth muscles. Calcium channel blockers also act on the smooth muscles of arterioles. Right? You know here are the arterioles. Is that right? This is arteries and arterioles. Now, you know arterioles are the major resistance vessel. When blood flow is moving from the arterial tree to the venous side, the major resistance to the flow is offered by arterioles. All of you know that? Now, actually, calcium channel blockers also work on the arteriole, right? Because arteriolar smooth muscle is also dependent on calcium influx through the calcium channel system. And drug also block here. So it means when arteriolar smooth muscles are not getting enough calcium, in the presence of calcium channel blockers, what will happen? Will they contract strongly or weakly? When calcium is unable to enter in smooth muscles of arterioles, then arterioles will constrict strongly or weakly? Weakly. If they constrict weakly, right, when you give calcium channel blockers which work on the arteriolar smooth muscle and calcium is not going into entering into arteriolar smooth muscle well, then arteriolar smooth muscle relax. And when arteriolar smooth muscle relax, diameter of arteriolar is more. Then the blood flow from the arterial side to venous side, it will have more resistance or less resistance. Again, when you are giving calcium channel blockers, calcium channel blocker relax these sphincters. So now the resistance to the blood flow from arterial side to the venous side is more or less? Yes. Less. Blood will very reduce to vasoconstriction. Jamie, let me explain it again to you. Listen. When you give calcium channel blockers, calcium cannot enter into these smooth muscles. So they cannot contract well. So they will relax. So there will be production of vasodilatation. But, but the right term should be that in the presence of calcium channel blockers, smooth muscles of arterioles cannot constrict well. So of course, physiologically, what is there? Vaso arteriolo dilation. And when these arteriolar system is dilated, blood can move from arterial side to venous side easily. Is that right? It means resistance to the flow from arterial side to venous side is reduced. Or we can say total, total, Peripheral resistance is reduced. Is that right? Total peripheral resistance is reduced. It means that when you give calcium channel blockers, if it produces arteriolar dilatation, it means now left heart is working against 
more resistance or less resistance? You know, function of the left heart is that it should contract, push the blood through arterial side into the venous side. Now, once you, if some calcium channel blocker work on the arteriole, then relax the arterioles, then left heart is working against less resistance. Now listen carefully. How do you define after load? We say ventricles have preload and after load. Preload is the amount of blood which is present in the ventricle at the end of diastole. Is that right? So preload is the amount of the blood which is in the ventricle on which ventricle has to pr produce its squeezing action, contracting action. Is that right? That is preload. What is afterload? Have you heard of this term? What is afterload? What's afterload? Afterload is the resistance against which left ventricle has to perform. I think I should repeat them about the donkey a little bit. Heart is like a donkey. Look, this is your heart. Right? Now this donkey has to go 70 times per minute up, take some load here and come back. It carries, normally heart is filled with how much blood? 140 ml. This is the load on the donkey before it start function. So we call it preload. What is it? Preload. And once donkey start moving up, systole start, it is moving against the slope. Slope is acting as a resistance, right? Now donkey is moving against the resistance. And when donkey is moving against the resistance, right? This resistance against which donkey has to perform, right? That is called after load. What is it called? After load. Is that right? So preload is the amount on the donkey before it start performing. After load is the resistance against which it has to perform. Is that right? Of course, it's a very stupid donkey. You know what it does? It goes at the top out of normally what it does. During one cycle, it takes 140 ml there, throw there only 70 ml and carries back 70 ml down. Right? So amount which originally it had, it is called end diastolic volume. And the resistance against which it has to pump the blood, that is after load. And whatever it leaves here is stroke volume. And whatever it brings on the back is called end systolic volume. The volume in the heart at the end of the systole. Is that right? I told you that what is, what is angina? Angina is a myocardium which is crying due to ischemia, producing pain. Is that right? Angina is a crying donkey. Right? If you want to reduce the cries of donkey, you must reduce the ischemia. Right? Very simple thing. Number one, you reduce the load. We discussed in previous lectures that if you reduce the preload, donkey will be happy. Is that right? Number two, why don't you reduce the? Yes, after load. If you reduce it like this, donkey will be happy or sad? I think you know donkeys very well. That's right. He knows donkeys will be very happy. So what really happens when you give venodilators and it relaxes? Listen now. In angina treatment, when you give nitrates, what are nitrates? Nitrates are venodilators. When you give the venodilators, veins dilate, blood pool over here and less blood is going to the ventricles. So it means when you give nitrates, this reduced filling of the ventricle and there's reduced end diastolic volume and nitrates or all the drugs which are venodilator, they are actually the drug which reduce the preloads. And in angina, you have to reduce the preload as well as you have to reduce afterloads. So that heart should act on less amount of volume and should act against less amount of resistance. So the work of the donkey should be reduced. So the donkey perform well with the reduced supply, reduced nutrition. So how do you reduce the resistance against which the donkey has to perform? How you can, what are the drugs which can bring this slope down? Yeah, all the drugs which are strong arterial load dilator. It's a basic concept. All the drugs which dilate the arterioles, they reduce the resistance against which the myocardial donkey has to perform. So it means that all the drugs which are arterial load dilators are primarily after load reducers. From today onward, please never forget. Venodilators are preload reducers. Arterial load dilators are after load reducers. Right? Am I clear?
So, some calcium channel blocker, okay, let me tell you what is that some? The classically nifedipine and related drugs. Nifedipine classically relaxes arterioles. When it, I take the tablet of nifedipine, it will classically more act on the arteriole and less act on the heart. Right? So, nifedipine is special type of calcium channel blocker. We also call them dihydropyridine group. Di hydropyridine derivative. Now, nifedipine and some related calcium channel blockers like amlodipine, nifedipine, amlodipine, philodipine, is that right? These are the calcium channel blocker which work more on the calcium channel of smooth muscle and work less on the calcium channel of heart. So, they are primarily arteriolodilators. So, when you give drug like nifedipine, it will relax the arterioles and heart will be pumping against less resistance so its oxygen requirement is less am i clear so yeah yeah now listen again back there were multiple ways to manage the angina one way was reduce the load on the donkey preload here we use the drugs which are veno dilators like nitrates and if you want to reduce the slope what, what group of drugs should be used in angina? Arterial. Yes, arterial load dilators. And if you further want to help this crying donkey, what can you do? Look, you reduce the load, you are donkey lover now. You reduce the load, you reduce the slope. After that, do a favor to donkey. Ask the donkey to make a favor to the donkey that if it is making 90 cycles per minute, let it make only 60 cycles per minute. Donkey will be sad or happy. Very happy. very happy is that right reduce the heart rate and even don't ask the donkey to run with the load let it walk it comfortably what is that negative not only heart rate but negative kinetotropy with less velocity it is moving is that right so not only you reduce the preload not only you reduce the afterload but help the donkey by reducing the by reducing the number of cycles and the velocity of cycle. It means we have to produce negative chronotropy as well as negative inotropy. That will also reduce the work of the donkey. You get it or not? So, now listen carefully. Here we put which drug? Which group? Preloader reducers, nitrates. Preloader reducers are nitrates, right? Vino dilator, vino dilators. And by reducing this slope, we are giving arteriolo dilator. And in which arteriolo dilator, classically it is nifedipine and related drug. Calcium channel blockers which are nifedipine, amylodipine, philodipine and related drug. Is that right? Once you have, now you have reduced the preload, you have reduced the afterload. Then let us the donkey reduce its work during the cycle. The drugs which will reduce heart rate and which will reduce contractility. That will also help the donkey. Here the drugs are number one, beta blockers. Here the drugs are beta blockers. You know beta blockers reduce the, what is that? They reduce the SA node activity and reduce the heart rate. If your heart rate is 90, you give beta blocker it may become 60. The donkey is happier that it has per minute, it has to produce less cycles. Number two, beta blockers also reduce contractility. Beta blockers also reduce contractility. So further, so donkey will not only produce less cycles, but it will produce the cycles comfortably. Is that right? Am I clear? And now, please concentrate on calcium channel blockers. Nifedipine mainly work on the arterioles, and verapamil mainly work on the heart because. Listen carefully, Hadayat, please concentrate. The calcium channels on smooth muscles are slightly different than the calcium channel on myocardium. Calcium channels on smooth arterial or smooth muscles are slightly different than the calcium channels on the heart. Some calcium channel blockers work more on arterial arteriolar side. Some calcium channels work more on heart and some calcium channels work on both of sides. If you know this group, you can really combine the drugs as they should be. Listen. Nifedipine is mainly what? Mainly working, working on? Arterial. 
arterioles arteriolar dilator and this is working mainly on heart so we can say and this is going to work on both now listen carefully let me draw this thing that delta as m look at it this work on the heart as well as work on the arterioles it has work on the heart as well as arterioles and this is the action of delta as m which has a balanced action it is arteriolar dilator as well as negative chronotroper as well as negative dromotroper as well as negative inotroper as well as negative clinotroper do you get it so delta as m reduces arteriolar dilate uh, constriction so it is reducing pre uh, afterload sorry delta as m reduces afterload as well as it reduces the cycling of the heart and reduces heart rate as well as contractility but when you come to the vrapamil look here vrapamil this is the vrapamil on the heart it has strong action it is stronger action on the heart but weaker action on arterioles only this so we can say vrapamil is more cardioselective and the fidopin is more arteriolosalective both of them are calcium channel blocker but this is more vasoselective or arteriolosalective and vrapamil is more cardioselective and delta has him work on both sides now why i'm so much stressing this thing let me tell you when you give a person a fidopin it mainly produces arteriolar dilatation and reduces diastolic blood pressure and reduces the afterload reduces the resistance against which heart has to perform this is a function of nifedipine now very important concept extremely important concept there is one type of angina in which ischemia to the heart is due to coronary vasospasticity there is one type of angina special type of angina in which the real pathology is not atherosclerotic lesion the real pathology is the coronary arteries undergo repeated spasticity coronary spasticity what is the name of that angina prince, prince metal angina excellent it is not classical angina it is prince metal angina what is prince metal angina it's a special type of angina in which cor there is coronary vasospasticity in this type of angina amount uh, out of these calcium channel blockers attention please in prince metal angina coronary vessels are spastic coronary arterial tree is spastic in prince metal angina which drug will be the best nifedipine or diltazem or vrapamil which is the best you want to dilate the arteries coronary is coronary is an artery nifedipine so you have to remember it it's a classical drug for prince metal angina it's a classical drug for vasospastic angina now you understand it that when a patient has angina due to coronary artery spasticity then you need a drug which will dilate the arterioles so we need what nifedipine but in case of classical angina this partial obstruction due to atherosclerotic plaque in that case all of them can be used why because if there is partial obstruction i told you in the last diagram if there is partial obstruction there is small amount of blood trickling to the myocardium and whenever myocardium has increased demand ischemia develop is that right classical angina in classical angina nifedipine can also help because in classical angina the nifedipine when dilates peripheral arterioles reduces the afterload and even in classical angina vrapamil can also be helpful because in classical angina we need to reduce the work of the heart and vrapamil can reduce the work of the heart by reducing heart rate and contractility now please listen special aspect you know in angina patient this is reducing the vascular constriction so it is somewhat like nitrates the fidopin is somewhat like nitrates even though nitrates are mainly veno dilator and the fidopin is mainly arterial dilator but both of them bring the blood pressure down please listen carefully what happens if you give nitrate to the patient what will happen veno dilatation and if you give calcium channel blocker of variety with the nifedipine arterial dilatation of course both of them will bring the blood pressure down and i told you told you previously that whenever blood pressure goes down there is reflex 
tachycardia because whenever blood pressure will go down baroreceptors will fire from the carotid sinus and activate the sympathetic outflow from central nervous system you know that right so whenever blood pressure goes down sympathetic outflow will occur powerful sympathetic outflow so when you give the patient nitrates or you give the patient nifedipine or you give the combination of these drugs patient has a tendency to develop hypotension and that hypotension has a tendency to precipitate reflex tachycardia and that reflex tachycardia may increase the work of the heart you understand it that tachycardia sympathetic overflow may increase the work of the heart that is why a wise doctor will combine these drugs with beta blocker so that arterial dilatation or veno dilator system when it produces strong sympathetic outflow let the sympathetic system fire but you put a block there what is that block beta blockers which do not allow the sympathetic nervous system to increase the heart rate that is why classically it's good to combine these drugs because in angina veno dilators and arterial dilator are very good veno dilator reduce the preload after dilator reduce the sorry arterial dilator reduce the afterload but if these two things are too much reduced there's a risk of uh, reflex tachycardia and reflex tachycardia can be blocked by beta blocker is that right but another way to control the reflex tachycardia there's another way let me tell you rather than using this calcium channel blocker why don't you use this one or that one because if you use verapamil with nitrates what will happen nitrates will do venodilator and precipitate reflex tachycardia system nitrates will do venodilator and may precipitate the increased sympathetic outflow this increased sympathetic outflow will try to increase the activity in sa node av node and contractility it is bad but with nitrates if you have combined the verapamil it is strongly inhibiting sa node and av node and this so action of sympathetic stimulatory action of sympathetic nervous system is cancelled by inhibitory action of the verapamil you could not understand hadith verapamil which is allowed with the nitrate yeah no what i was trying to say what i was trying to tell you was that those drugs which produce reflex tachycardia reflex tachycardia is dangerous you should have some way to prevent the reflex tachycardia okay, reflex. right listen one way the best way to prevent the reflex tachycardia is that somehow you keep the sa node and myocardium somewhat inhibited the keep the myocardium inhibited one way is give the beta blockers other way to inhibit the myocardium is give those calcium channel blockers which are cardio selective what happened there do you get it jamie now what are the implications of this listen carefully all calcium channel blockers are not same primarily i have divided them into three groups when you give injection of nifedipine to someone but usually it is given orally if someone is on nifedipine what is the risk reflex tachycardia but when someone is on heavy verapamil what is the risk risk direct bradycardia i think nitrate was a risk for tachycardia look nitrates are risk for tachycardia as well as nifedipine is also risk for tachycardia because nitrates dilate the veins reduce the blood pressure nifedipine dilates the arteries again blood pressure goes down again tachycardia this is what i'm trying to put in your mind that all the drugs which reduce the blood pressure significantly has a tendency to produce reflex activation of the heart they have a tendency to produce reflex sympathetic activation of the heart is in angina such activation is good or bad, bad. it's bad we don't want it is that right is it clear yes so what can we do we can do number 1 with the nitrates or with the nifedipine when you add the beta blockers so let them stimulate the sympathetic outflow but beta blocker keep the sympathetic receptors blocked so sympathetic system powerfully activated but unable to drive the heart wild is that right mm -hmm. then there's second strategy also if you don't want to give beta blocker for example someone has asthma he has angina and with that asthma asthma chronic obstructive airway disease will you give beta blockers no in previous lecture i have mentioned that beta blocker may precipitate strong bronchoconstriction or someone has 
very severe diabetes, can you give beta blocker? You have to be very cautious. Now you have to give nitrate and you don't want to give beta blocker. But nitrates you are giving, giving in heavy dose. So you have are worried about that nitrates may not precipitate tachycardia. Ideal way was block the tachycardia by beta blocker, but beta blocker is contraindicated in your patient. Then you will give calcium channel blocker, but you should be wise. Don't add nifedipine to his drugs. You will add verapamil. So that, what, what's the beautiful combination that we, nitrates dilate the veins, right? Try it even if some reflex tachycardia sympathetic activation is there, but verapamil is keeping S node, AV node and myocardium inhibited so that it is not responsive to sympathetic overstimulation. Plus, verapamil will of course by reducing heart rate and contractility will also reduce the oxygen demand. But there is one thing. Verapamil can produce sinus arrest, verapamil can produce nodal arrest, heart blocks, verapamil can precipitate cardiac failure if there is too much negative inotropy. Did you get it? But can the fidipine can precipitate such things? No. So these were the important delicate differences within the group. That even though these drugs are grouped as one group, calcium channel blockers, but as a good doctor, you must know that this is mainly arterial load dilator, it is mainly cardio inhibitor and it works on the both parameters. Am I clear to all of you? Right? So under what circumstances we use calcium channel blocker? The special uses of calcium channel blockers are number one, the uses of calcium channel blockers. Number one, calcium channel blockers are used in angina. But again you should talk about this classical angina and there is Prince metal angina. In classical angina, right, with nitrates plus beta blocker, if you want to add calcium channel blocker, is that right? In classical angina, you can use any one of them, right? Any one of them, depending upon which parameter you want to change. But in case of, what is this? Prince metal angina, the best drug is nifedipine because it is coronary artery dilator. Nifedipine is coronary artery dilator. Is that right? Here I will mention one more calcium channel blocker. This is called Bepredel. A new calcium channel blocker, Bepredel. Actually, this is a very special of uh, type of calcium channel blocker. Number one, it produces coronary arteriolar dilatation. Number two, it blocks the cardiac sodium and potassium channels. Now listen here, it's unusual drug. Like the nifedipine, it can do coronary arterial dilatation. Like other calcium channel blocker, it can inhibit S node, AV node and contractility. But it has an additional function, it can block some of the sodium and potassium channels. I will explain into detail during arrhythmias that when sodium channels and potassium channels are dysfunctional, when sodium channels and potassium channels are dysfunctional, a very special type of, unique type of arrhythmias are produced. These are called Torsa di Pointus. Have you heard of them? Okay, I will explain it there. But I just mentioned here the very special type of tachyarrhythmias which are called Torsa di Pointus. Twisting points. Actually, QRS complex goes like this. For few QRS complex are having points upward, then for few beats they are having downward. Then again they have upward. So this type of special type of tachycardia is called tachycardia with twisting points. Torsa di Pontus. Now this type of tachycardia, I will explain in the lecture with arrhythmia, it is due to defective sodium or potassium channels. So this type of, you can say, disease can be managed by Bepredel, which is calcium channel blocker, sodium channel blocker, potassium channel blocker, as well as coronary dilator. So when a patient comes to you with angina plus a tendency for Torsa di Pontus, what is the best drug? Bepredel. Is that right? The best drug is? Bepredel. Again, I will mention that nifedipine has a very special group. What is the name of that group? Dihydropyridine derivatives. These derivatives are more arteriolo dilator and less cardio suppressor. Is that right? But reflexly, they can stimulate the cardiac activity. Is that right? And now let's go to the side effects of calcium channel blockers. This is a good news, very easy to understand. Side effects of nifedipine are like nitrate side effect. 
and side effects of rapamila like beta blockers because this is cardio inhibitor and beta blockers are a cardio inhibitor and nitrates are vasodilator and nifedipine is also vasodilator but let me tell you what are the major side effects related with these drugs nifedipine specially because it is arterial dilator right if arterioles are too much dilated especially in the head and neck that may produce severe throbbing headache i told you the mechanism of headache in the lecture in previous lecture right again so what happens nifedipine nifedipine right when it produces strong arterial dilator and if arteries passing through the meninges when they dilate too much right you can how the arterial dilator drug produce the headache these are the vessels which are passing through foramina this is intracranial cavity it is extracranial area these are the blood vessels which are passing through this area and i told you that these blood vessels which are passing through the foramina they are having sleeves of they are having sleeves of what is this dura mater and this part of the dura mater which is making a sleeve around the blood vessels when they are passing through foramina cranial blood vessels this part of the sleeve has unique very very sensitive pain receptors what are these pain receptors so what really happens any drug which produces strong vasodilatation has a tendency to produce severe headache how this headache is produced let's remain focused let's suppose you take any strong arterial dilator it may be the fedipine it may be hydralazine or any other drug it when these are